Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the program. It's the Jeff Gersman Show for June 4th, 2024. Uh, this is the week. This is the this is the week when everything will happen. Uh, this coming weekend is the big summer games fest blow off, where games will be announced. Uh, the title will change hands. I'm sure. Uh, all sorts of things uh, booked for this weekend. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I don't know. This this uh, th- th- there's a different. <laughs> I don't know. There's a weird. A weird feel leading up to this one, um, and uh, we'll we'll get into it in, in the news, uh, and 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 talk about some some predictions and and stuff. I I have a you know I've been trying to just play some games. I don't know. There's there's a so you know like I'm I'm about two years in now to to this lovely endeavor that we're endeavoring here. Um, you know the the Jeff Gerstmann show, and it's been a very interesting two years. I think you know for for me, of course, you know, just like it's such a it, it is, it's been such a big change from you know the the well, not I mean it's not that big of a change actually, um, but it, you know it's been a, it's been a shift for sure in kind of how I run things and 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 really starting to kind of rethink like what matters. When when talking about video games, when covering video games, when when thinking about um how to spend my time, what is the what is the best way? What is the best way for me to to spend that time? And the answer, you know, I I, I feel like it's it's it hasn't changed that much because I it's it's the stuff that I genuinely care about, and it's kind of a mix. I think it's always a mix of like the the big games that everyone kind of wants to know about <clears throat> for sure um you know there whether people are genuinely interested in a game or they're rubbernecking because they're expecting it to be bad like you know the 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 big games are things that people they're, they're big talking points people want to know more about them and um and 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 all of that and then there's the smaller stuff that you know like might fly under the radar now more than ever with the the number of games that, that come out all the time um there's just so much stuff coming out always um, that a, a lot of games fall through the cracks. And so th- there's sort of that other, I hesitate to call it advocacy, but it, but it is sort of, you know, advocating for individual games and saying like, no, here, here's a thing you might miss. Uh, and, uh, you know, you should, uh, you should check this out. If you, if you, if you missed this, you should give it a look for sure. Um, that's kind of always been how I've how I've viewed it, you know, is that there's there's sort of a mix and it used to be more of like a uh you cover the big games because everyone covers the big games and it helps you establish a tone and lets people know what you're about, what you stand for, where you stand on the big issues that everyone kind of knows about. Um and then covering that stuff well affords you the opportunity to um People will will follow you on games they maybe haven't heard of, and and we'll we'll take a look at some of these smaller things, right? That that was that was always sort of the philosophical thing, you know, uh, dating back to the you know the 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 mid to late two thousands, um, as to kind of how I thought about this stuff. Once once you once you I've given up on covering everything, right? And which I don't think anyone can do. Any one individual outlet no matter how big they are there are so many things coming out that there's there's really just no way to to cover everything anymore um like there was in you know 2002 2003 you know it was just like oh here's the gamecube version of this coming out and and you know like all right cover you know review it just it was easy review it you should review it should you review it yes or no yeah yeah do it um and just try to do damn near everything uh barring like you know there was always like the budget pc titles the the big rigs of the world uh, were generally games that would fall through the cracks unless they, you know, unless, unless we ended up with a copy of it and then like, hey, you know, things happen, right? Um, and yeah, I don't know. So it, it's been, 
the feeling two years ago when I started, it was like, well, just pick up where you left off and we'll keep going, you know? And, um, I think that works fine. I think that that is still a sensible target, right? Of just like, okay, like, I, because at the end of the day, I am generally covering the things that I'm interested in. But, you know, there would occasionally be a game here and there that, you know, someone asked before, um, and, and I don't mean to use this as an, as an example because I am, like, loosely interested in it, um, I suppose. But someone asked, like, oh, did you see the, the Elden Ring expansion? Because I think previews of that hit today. And, you know, I, I had recently gotten an invite to go see it, and I, I ended up not doing it. Um, because I just, you know, like, I don't, I don't have, like... I, you could sit me down in front of that thing and I, I would believe you if you just said it was part of the main game because I, I didn't play enough Elden Ring to to really have a, um, you know, to have a need for more of it, I guess. Like, you know, and, and I'm curious to see what they're doing, if they're doing things that massively change the game or whatever, or if it's just a thing that they're bolting on more content, which, you know, I think people would be happy with either for sure um, when that thing does finally come along. Um, but it was this feeling, you know, as I'm booking appointments for things this weekend and, and thinking about, and, and I'm, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't know what's been announced and not announced, so I'm not going to use any game names or anything, but like, there were a couple of things that came my way that seemed like they were big deals. It seemed like, oh, this is, hmm, oh, and then I thought about it and I was like, what am I, you know, am I going to have anything meaningful to say about this game, uh, that rooted in this fantasy property that I have like straight up negative interest in not even like zero interest just like below below the jail levels of interest in this stuff and I was like yeah no I'm, I'm gonna just I'm not I'm not gonna do this um I'm not gonna go see that um and it's you know I don't know it, it it felt weirdly well I don't know it's it's a mix of freeing and a mix of, and like a little bit of guilt because I think you know after decades and decades of never saying no um it's weird it still feels weird you know um a lot of the ways that this business used to work was you know it was like you covered a company's small games and that would help you get in you know you would cover their big games and you maybe would get the exclusives on the big games and and so part of the policy that we had at like events like let's say atari you know not this current atari but infogrames as atari which is always the company that when i think about like events that have a zillion games at them two of them matter but there are 40 games here the, the atari is always the company i think about you know, um, you know, you, you want to get big information on whatever those two big games are. You want to get the exclusive on those. And so, you know, you find yourself interviewing associate producers on every single GBA kids game they brought, <laughs> you know, and you would see the views on those videos back in the day and they'd be in the dozens or something. You just be like, oh, this is none of this was worth <laughs> anyone's time. It's, it's sad, you know, like whatever, You're like, but like, that's just kind of how it is. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think that, that there's always been a need for some kind of um, filter, some kind of bar, uh, whatever it is. And I, I think different outlets are going to measure that differently. I, I'm sure that like, there, you know, there are times that we had something like this. I would not be shocked if there were like, algorithms that were determining some of this stuff it's like well you know okay th this there's enough traffic going to this that it's worth it for us to let's say do an early access review of this game but uh we're not going to update that re un unless traffic goes up and interest goes up and interest is maintained we're not going to maintain that review blow by blow with every patch um we're just not going to do that because there are 40 more games came out the next day and we've got to move on you know um and I think that like that's valid. I think that you at some point everyone has to come up with a fucking filter. Someone has to come out with a bar for just like okay below this line we have to we have to move on. Like we can't we don't have the people. You know IGN is probably still the biggest staff out there. I mean especially after you know if we if we count that they just absorbed editorial staffs from Eurogamer and some other sites as, as their recent purchase for sure. Like if we think about that as a network, they are almost certainly the largest editorial team in the business. And they don't have the resources to 
chase everything down to update everything to make sure everything is, you know, and, and so, you know, I, I think about that as like, you know, what does that mean for me as an individual doing this right, right now? You know, <clears throat> like what's the, what's the line? Um, and the thing I've been falling back on is, is things that I'm interested in or things that I would think will be fun to do something with one way or the other, you know? Um, and, and that's been working out pretty well so far. There's weird things, right? I mean, you know, like the, um, that Elden Ring DLC is a good example, but like, you know, there's, uh, you know, we ended up talking about it on the podcast, but like, uh, when, when hell, uh, hell blade, hell blade, man, hell blade two came out. Um, the like textbook thing to do would have been like, well, I'm going to make a video and we'll talk about it on the podcast and we'll do this. And you know, it's a, it's a first party release. So therefore it should get this, 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 and this because people will be interested in it or whatever. And I ended up not making a video of it because I just don't think the game is conducive to making like a great, it's not a fun watch, <laughs> you know, like here's uh here's this bloody lady stumbling through the fog and getting in a couple of sword fights while I shrug. You know, it's at some point, um, that's not amazing fodder one way or the other. So, so I chose not to do it, you know, and at the time that felt weird, you know, I was like, ah, I should have done this. Like, you know, like I'm, I'm like laying in bed a little guilty about it. Like, oh, I should have, I should have probably made a video or whatever, but like, you know, well, no, it, it's, I don't have, I, I don't have anything more to say about that game that I didn't say on the podcast. And, uh. And so, you know, it's at that point just makes a lot of sense to move on. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really have a conclusion to this other than that it's, it's an, it's an everyday ongoing thing. And the bar is always sliding and the scale is always sliding depending on the time available, what else is coming out and, and everything else, you know, there, there are a billion different factors that can, you know, my allergies impacting the way that I speak and my throat already hurting, even though we're only 10 minutes into this podcast will impact things one way or the other. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think, um, I think a lot of things about game coverage, um, are hard and harder now than they were because, because games are never done. Like think about the early access moniker and what it's supposed to mean in terms of, updates a game is getting and, and look at some of the updates that some games in early access get you know sometimes it's just bug fixes sometimes it's full-on additional features and we added a new faction you know d d depending on the game but then you know um multiverses comes out or comes back out i guess and is missing a bunch of features and you've got like the the head of that team on social media going oh yeah we didn't have time those features are coming though so what's, what is early access, you know, like at that point, what's the line, you know, Starfield has been in public beta branches on steam getting updates and they've got all the other stuff that they've planned for that. And, you know, e even the games that are single player in nature are never really truly done until the developer just decides to move on. And so it, it's a. In some ways, I think that's a good thing because I think the expectations have changed because I think people want people want their games to change. They want reasons to come back to games they like. You know, look at Fortnite is a great example of this, you know, um, where that's just built into their DNA of just like, hey, we're throwing this island away and putting a new island in there. And we've got some kind of loose framework for a story that we put in there that I don't know, the rock showed up and then the island blew up and, uh, you know, and now the guy from Family Guy is here. Um, and then three months later, here's another reason for this part of it to sink into the water and now there are cars or, you know, or whatever it is, right? You know, um, Baldur's Gate 3 is another good example. Yeah, that's, that's a good example of a game. That I'm, you know, that game was in early access for a good long time and it came out of early access and then still got some pretty substantial updates and bug fixes and things that you know that they just they needed more time to fix <clears throat> games don't ship it's, no one ships their 1.0 and just goes like all right off to the next one they ship their 1.0 and go oh there's like nine things that we missed 
and we've got to we've we've got to hang back and make sure that those are fixed and 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 all that other stuff before we before we we move on it's nice in some ways the games are malleable are more malleable than they were because again i i think that there is something valuable about a game that updates over time and gives you more uh, as you're playing it, D depending on the type of game. I, I, I think that kind of backfires. Like Starfield's another a, a good example of like, here's a single player game that I finished and they could make a million updates to it. Uh, but I already finished that game. I know how the story ends. Uh, you're uh, there's there's no value added there for me um, because I'm extremely not going to go back and play it again. Cyberpunk was another one, but you know, the cyberpunk eventually made so many content updates and the bug fixes were so severe. Some of the things they had to correct were so heinous, uh, that you almost had to go back, uh, when they added all the Ray reconstruction and the big graphical update, you know, then it was like, well, I, you know, this is now like cutting edge technology. And now I, now I want to go back and see it for that reason. Um, and I went back to it and, and discovered that I still think that the writing in that game is fucking terrible. <laughs> um, they just had, there was just an update recently, you know, that they said like, you know, right now for the first time in however many years, no one is working on cyberpunk. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like they, you know, they have theoretically put it to bed, barring something new popping up, requiring them to, to go back and fix it and, and everything else. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, and so I, I think like games coverage, and, and this is part of what makes reviewing games so difficult now, or, or rather like, it's not that it's difficult, it's that it's ineffective, you know, um, for the, for, over, over time anyway, because like think, you know, if you would apply the classic like, here's how we review games rhetoric to Fortnite when it first came out, you would have a review of Fortnite's tower defense mode and you would say yeah this is okay i guess this is fun with friends but like don't play it with strangers which is was my feeling on it at the time it was like i had some really good times with what they now call save the world in Fortnite, um playing it with other people who write about games at events and and other stuff like that and if you had written that review and been like yeah it's okay i don't know um that Fortnite's not even that game anymore. I mean, it's, that game's in there somewhere, hiding underneath a bunch of stuff. But like, God. Um, and so, I, you know, I like. I think that the the value of a review obviously is very different now. The shelf life of it, um, as like as as actual advice that you might be able to follow, the, that shelf life is basically zero. Um. It's interesting to look at from a, at, at, at a, you know, like, hey, what was this game like at this point in time? I think that's fascinating, but to a much smaller audience, to the people that actually want reviews to help them, that want reviews to provide a service, that's never been more difficult. But for people who just like games and like games criticism and like to read about games and read thoughtful articles about games, that stuff still has plenty of value, you know? And, and that's, that's sort of where I think there's some, some breakdown in terms of like, you know, the, the people that are probably listening to this podcast are, are into games enough that they would probably still be interested in that sort of thing, right? Um, but I'm talking about the more casual audience that's like, I saw a TV ad that they made a Black Ops 6. What's going on with that? You know, or all these damn kids keep talking about Fortnite and Skibbity Toilet. Where do I find those games? Where do I find Skibbity Toilet video game? That's what I type into the search engine every day. Where do I find Skibbity Toilet video game? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just... Um, I'm kind of like ri taking it day by... Like riding away. Just like, hey, I'm, I'm just going to do what makes sense at, at any given time. Uh, when it comes to what games I'm going to cover or not cover or, or, or whatever else and, and try to make the best of it. It, it was, it was sort of a, a, a fear I had, um, when I started ranking the eight bit Nintendo stuff, 
I was like, okay, well, I'm really, I'm really kind of only doing two gaming streams a week. Do I want to have half of that output completely taken over by old games? And it was this knee jerk thing of like, oh man, I don't know. What if a big game comes out and I would want it? And, and, and the actual answer was like, who fucking cares? There will be time for that later. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here trying to like, I'm going to have the first video up of this video game and it's going to get a million views and then I'll be the bell of the ball. You know, like it doesn't, you know, none of that shit is real. So, uh, but what is real is, is dedicating the time and doing the work and whatever else. So, you know, like I, the 8-bit Nintendo stuff has actually been some of the most fun stuff I've done lately, but that doesn't mean I want to like become some full-time like retro video game dude, because I think there are a bunch of those already. And I think that I'm still far too fascinated by the modern video game industry to not devote a great deal of time to staring at it <laughs> and wondering why it's doing what it's doing. Um, how is it falling apart this week or, or whatever? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It, like, it, it's just, it, it's maintaining a different type of balance, I suppose. Um, that's all a very long winded way of saying, um, thanks to everyone who's been, you know, with me on this journey for the past two years, you know, it's been, um, really exciting. Uh, it's been terrifying at times. I don't know. There, there are like different aspects of it that, you know, that, that hit harder when, when you are, uh, doing it by yourself. Um, and, you know, certainly when, when everyone in the house got COVID and I had to miss some podcasts and stuff, it was definitely this feeling of just like, oh, shit, man, there's no backup. There's, there's no backup. And that's kind of nice. I don't know. Um, especially for the, where the market is right now and, and, and everything like, you know, keeping, staying nimble, I suppose, is the, is the thought there. But, um, but yeah, thanks for everyone who has, uh, you know, backed these efforts if you're interested in, interested in doing so, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman or I guess dopeassvideogames.com will get you there as well. Um, and, uh, and check it out and we'll, we'll weather this storm together and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spend all of our time staring at video games and figuring out what the hell is going on. Uh, and also a lot of older games and figuring out what the hell was going on with uh Castellian for the NES, which I spent some time playing other ports of that over the weekend. It's a miserable, uh, it's a miserable video game. Uh, you can go back and watch the video from Friday. Um, if you want to, if you want to catch that. Um, but I went and played the game boy version and also it came out on the Commodore 64 under the name nebulous in that version. He pops out of a little submarine at the beginning. And that's nice. That's a little, a little fun, little tweak, I guess. Um, and, uh, that is some of the, that might be the angriest I've ever been on camera or, or most visibly angry. I don't know. I don't know. I was, I was unhappy about, I was unhappy about how that went. Uh, but then I found myself playing like five other, five other versions of the game and nodding my head at it going like, I hate this. Um, Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about Salako and Arctic eggs and uh, a little more multiverses in the news and stuff. But let's uh, let's take this ad break and then we'll we'll get back and, and really get into it. All right. Stay tuned. It's getting hot, so hot, and your nighttime bedroom temperatures can have a huge impact on your sleep quality. If you're waking up too hot or too cold, you've got to check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. These sheets are inspired by NASA and use silver-infused fabrics that are temperature-regulating so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Now, what else do they do? You're like, oh, well, that's, that's great and all, but what else? What else for me? All right, fine. They do even more than that. They don't just keep you cool at the perfect temperature all night long. That silver infusion also helps them to self-clean preventing up to 99.7% of bacterial growth. That leaves them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Keeps the stank off them. That's important. You want to live a, 
Uh, just, uh, you know, I, I, I think you should live a stank free life. That's that's just, uh, you know, the, the, as, as best as best you can. The sheets will help. They're also luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. And they feel as nice, if not nicer than sheets used by some five star hotels. These sheets are on my bed right now. I slept in them last night. I was sleeping them again tonight. And I can tell you, there's no stench on them. And that's nice. Stop sleeping on bacteria. It'll clog up your pores. It'll cause breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. How? I'm glad you asked. Go to trymiracle.com slash Jeff to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use the promo code Jeff at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Jeff and use the code Jeff to claim your free for three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Jeff to treat yourself. And thanks to Miracle Made for sponsoring the episode. All right, we're back. Salako is a first-person shooter. is available now on Steam. It's in early access. It is <clears throat> powered by the GZ Doom engine, which is a source port of the original Doom engine that they have updated to add a bunch of features in it and, and, and everything else. But it is... It, this is a commercial product built on GZ Doom. It's great. That that sentence alone is already kind of fucking not nuts. Um, and it is a sci-fi themed first person shooter. It does not feel like Doom, uh, especially. There are moments in it where you see uh, flat kind of 2D enemies running at you in some cases that are turning in such a way that you're like, oh, this is the Doom engine. Um, but it, uh, you know, you are, I'm playing with a freaking controller, which is even crazier. So it, it is like straight up. You are pull, pulling down the left trigger to aim down sights and pulling the right trigger to fire them, to fire the guns. Um, it's a sci-fi themed first person shooter. You are crawling through vents and jumping out of things, finding keys, opening doors, dealing with exploding tanks and, uh, and shooting down a bunch of soldiers, uh, along the way as you make your way through this ship. Spaceship, space colony. I'm not entirely sure what it is. It's like 25 bucks on Steam right now, which uh, if you told me a, a, a game built in GZ Doom is, is asking $25 on Steam, I would be like, what? But it's it's kind of fucking badass. Like it feels really nice. Like the production quality is is really good. Like you forget at times that it does have this kind of old timey look to it um, <clears throat> because there is just enough detail to it that it, it it works um it works way better than i thought like going like hearing about and hearing like oh someone built a game in gz doom and they're selling it on steam like okay well all right um let's let's see what this is about it feels like a very modern feeling first person shooter campaign modern is maybe a weird word it does not feel like it came out in the era of doom it does not feel it's trying to be some retro first person shooter thing a boomer shooter if you will it doesn't feel like it's trying to do that it feels like it has a very specific look to it um that evokes an older style of graphics but it doesn't necessarily skimp on style you have a really good low slide you can do under doors and you know like there's and it, it, it that stuff moves really fast it's got uh analog like it has actual full analog movement with the with the controller and stuff, which I was a little shocked. Again, you just you think about Doom and you think about those mechanics translated, and you're like, oh, it's weird that it has analog movement, but it but it does. Um, it's cool. It is it is still in early access in a way that makes me think like I should maybe I should maybe wait off a little bit. But you know, you're picking up data pads with key codes on them. And what are your thoughts? You know, this is something I don't. So, so it has you picking up data pads. And you can go read messages that were people emails that people wrote to other people, 
And in classic video game fashion, some of those emails include uh, codes for doors, four digit key codes to open doors. Do you like it when you have to manually enter the, the, the key codes at those doors? Or do you think that if you find the code and get to that door, that it should just pop up and automatically enter it and you should be able to walk through? I like there's there's one type of middle ground that I like where I can't remember which game did this. It's something that I played relatively recently. I don't think it was System Shock. Um, it was something where when you got to a keypad, it popped up like the the relevant page of that had the code on it or, or or had the hint of like what the code was right there next to it, so you didn't have to go dig in your notes and figure out what you were looking for. Um, I thought that was a decent little. Uh, middle ground. Yeah, Stellar Blade. You're right. Stellar Blade did that. Um, I thought that was a fun little middle ground where you still get to go through the manual process of punching in codes on the keypad, uh, but without having to to memorize a thing or, you know, or dig through your notes or, or whatever. I, yeah, I think I, I just, I think I prefer that middle, middle level of, or full assistance of just like, you know, this code, open the door. Um, and instead of having to punch it in manually, I don't know. Um, Salako mainly has you fighting, um, enemy guards. They seem, they're not necessarily bullet spongy per se, but they do take a few more shots to drop than I thought. Um, they'll like drop to their knees and stand back up and keep shooting you. That's, it's an interesting, um, hit reactions that some of the, some of the enemies have, uh, Anyway, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm still pretty early on in it. I just wanted to kind of call it out and say, Hey, it's, it's really neat. Uh, yeah, you can do headshots, which is not something that GZ doom is necessarily, you know, it's not really a, a big headshot game, the original doom. Um, but, uh, it's cool. It's very cool. You should look at Salako if you haven't uh, seen it already. Um, Arctic Eggs. This has been out for a little bit. I streamed some of it last week. This is uh, a, it's a really basic physics-y kind of game. Uh, the, the game part of the game is this little physics-y thing that you kind of do over and over again with different types of restrictions um, and, and rules and, and items. Um, but the basic idea of it, I guess, is that you are the poultry, the poultry plucker, the poultry preparer. What's it, it says on the Steam page? We need to go look. I need to get this right. Um, poultry uh, peddler, and you're in Antarctica, cooking eggs for people, and so you're walking around this uh, Antarctic hellscape, just frozen. Just people, ice cold, just, just, you know, horrible snow. And, and, you know, it's like this weird futuristic kind of slum city, cyber city looking thing set up. And, uh, some people are hungry. And so you need to walk around and talk to everyone. And that is where the game gets great is, um, <clears throat> the, the dialogue, the, uh, it's not even dialogue. You don't really talk back the monologues, uh, the, the, the writing in Arctic eggs. I think it's really fun. I think it's really funny. Um, it is. It is like it's weird in the right ways. It, it's weird without feeling like like ah, we just wrote some random stuff. Aha, you know, like it, it. It all feels like it's coming from the same place. And um, uh, some of the things that these characters say to you before they have you cook them food is, is really that. That is the part that's worth the trip for me. In, in a couple of different ways, it's got like this Xavier Renegade Angel thing going on, mostly because the guards have this nose piece on that really looks like uh, Xavier did. That That's the most direct thing, I guess. But um, So when people are hungry, you have to make them eggs. And so a pan appears, and then an egg is floating over it. You push the button to drop the egg into the pan. You have to move it around until it kind of pops, like until it cooks on one side, and then you have to physics your way into flipping the egg over. And so you use a mouse or you can use uh, a controller to, to do it. But um, I, I find the mouse actually works 
quite a, quite a bit better. Um, and you flip the egg over, cook it on that side for a while, and then you're done. But some people have more specific needs. And so they'll be like, okay, I want an egg, but for, and, and they will say it in a more flavorful way, but you'll find yourself cooking an egg and a cigarette. And the cigarette provides a weird timer because the cigarette is burning down as it cooks. And so you have to cook the egg quickly enough so that the cigarette does not burn out as you go. Uh, eventually this becomes like it's, it's two eggs. And then th th someone throws a can of sardines in there. And if you cook the can of sardines long enough, it pops open and three fish pop out. And then you need to cook those fish. And it, it, it just keeps escalating from there to the point where I have not finished it yet, but the last time I launched it, it had me cooking an egg and an open beer bottle. <clears throat> And, um, you can spill the beer into the pan all you want, and it will have all these liquid blobs that go in there. But if any bit of the liquid falls out, you lose and have to start that, start that sequence over again. So if anything at all falls out of the pan, you have to restart it. And so it's very easy to just like be physicsing your way into this and being like, so I managed to do it without even spilling. By the time I was done run of a lifetime. I managed to cook and flip an egg in a pan without even knocking the beer bottle over. It didn't spill a drop. I'm like, fuck yeah, this is great. This feels good. It's got a sandbox mode that I guess when you, when you finish it, so you can throw a, you know, you can, you can throw a bunch of the, the different food items together and, and, and watch it break or, or, or try to, to cook things successfully. Um, you know, it's like, like puffer fish that will bounce around in your pan and you have to try to make sure that you're catching them and, and, it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's one note in a lot of ways, but because of all the different types of food and items that Arctic eggs is constantly giving you, the physics puzzle evolves in a lot of ways to where you're like, okay, now this is hard. And now I need to be careful with this way I can, and be careful in a slightly different way to make sure that this is happening and this is happening and I'm not spilling this and I'm not, you know, and, um, it's really good. It's a, it's a, it's a very slight, it, it doesn't feel like it's a particularly long game. I feel like I'm probably about halfway through it. Um, already after a, a couple of hours here, it doesn't, doesn't feel like the longest thing, but the writing is really fun. It's, uh, multiple variations on a theme. And I think that the theme that, that physics puzzle theme is, is really fun. And the bits that you of lore or whatever, the bits of the things you learn about the world as you go, about the leader of this, whatever this encampment is, uh, was it the saint of seven stomachs? I think is, I forget the his exact name, but, um, <clears throat> and how you have been stripped of most of your functionality so that you can only make eggs, which is a haunting when it, when it is said, it is said in a haunting way because you're ostensibly a human, but you're like, I don't know. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I am. I'm not sure what I am. In this game, it never shows your character or maybe if it maybe shows it later, but it has not showed what I am. Um, just that I just that I cook the eggs that I walk around in first person perspective and walk up to people and cook the eggs. And then I first person make some eggs. And then I move on to the next person. Um, it's delightful. It's a it's a it is a wonderful. Um, goofy sometimes weird, uh, experience. And so, yeah, our Arctic eggs, I think it is, is worth looking at for sure. Um, and I spent some more time with multiverses and I don't, I don't like what they've done with multiverses. I finally went back and watched a video of what multiverses used to run like before they put it back out. And it's so slow and it feels so sluggish. Um, this is a situation like I was just talking about at the top of the show where they've got a lot of things on their plate that they intend to roll out for that game that might help. Like they're going to have an adjustable input buffer. So if you mash the buttons a little bit, you're not just doing moves for what seems like a minute. It's not a minute, but it, it feels like you are just like locked in with these attacks forever sometimes. And, uh, you know, they rebuilt the game in unreal engine five. So, in the time that they were down, they did, you know, some pretty massive overhauls to it, but, um, it just, it, it feels muddy. It feels like molasses. Like just the, the game feels like it is, it is coated in a thick sludge 
and you're not moving right. You're not moving the way you want to be moving. Uh, and yeah, I don't know, man. I, like it, it, people don't seem thrilled about it. Like I kind of, I, I think I, I finally figured out what, what people are, are specifically not happy about, uh, when it comes to multiverses. And I kind of tapped into that a little bit and I'm like, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. This doesn't, this feels completely off. And then the monetization is all over the place and, and the single player stuff when you're leveling up gems and getting gem XP and equipping these perks and just like, like there's just a lot of out of game stuff that I think is really, uh, gets in its way. Um, I wonder if like this, I, I know that some people do seem like they are into it. Um, there was a story that they, they removed Iron Giant from the game recently, and I guess a play, an Iron Giant player was mid-tournament when that happened, and then suddenly had to change characters mid-tournament, which is ridiculous. Um, Multiverses feels bad, and, I, and I, I, don't, I wonder if it will catch on again all over again. It felt like that they had a chance last time it was out. This time... Um, this time multiverses feels off in a way that I'm, I'm left wondering, like, did they just kind of like accidentally doom this game by launching it this way? Cause they, again, they talk about like, Oh yeah, no, there's, yeah, we, there's a lot of stuff we have in the works. Some of it's in the game already. It's just not quite ready yet. We're, we're going to have it out as soon as we can. <clears throat> it's like the game was offline for however long. Like, it just seems like you should have gotten that stuff in there before putting it out. But that was a weird one. So I wonder if they ended up, if they must have like had their date shift a handful of times because they had McDonald's Happy Meal toys for the return of multiverses, but they had them like three months ago or something. Like well before the game had come back out. So like in an ideal scenario, I think you would want the game to be out again when those toys were hitting. And so I, I wonder if they just, you know, because I'm sure that you know, McDonald's probably has windows for that and you get your window for here's when the multiverses promotion is happening and then we're moving right on to Inside Out 2 or whatever. I think they're, that's yeah, literally, I think they're doing Inside Out 2 right now. It's a weird thing to suddenly know again, being a parent and suddenly understanding that yes, there are Happy Meal toys still. They're all garbage. Actually, the multiverses ones are really bad. They were really bad. Um, there's some Captain America ones that were like at least these little plush these little plush dolls and they were doing a bunch of like Disney little figurines that were, that weren't bad for what they were. Um, but the multiverses ones were like, here's some cards and they were terrible garbage. Um, but I have to imagine that like that, that was originally. Yeah. And the, yes. And the Captain America movie's not out yet either. It's just, you're right. Yeah. There's, there's, so I, I imagine that people must miss their, must miss their windows, but have their happy meal toy dates locked in. Um, well before the thing goes, that must be something that happens at least a few times a year. Um, let's get into the news. Hmm. Sorry, let me hit the button. That way, you know, I mean it. PlayStation state of play happened. <clears throat> Uh, that happened last Thursday. They had a 30, 35 minute showcase where they ran through 14 different games. Um, it's hard to like after the fact that it's hard to know what the general takeaway was from this. I think people were pretty down on it, but people are always down on these things when they don't have like Bloodborne 2 in it or whatever, you know, um, and so looking at the the live chat on YouTube or Twitch when this thing was ending, um, were people just going like, this is the worst. What? How, of course they're going to announce Bloodborne 2. Like, no, they're, they're super fucking not. Um, and so, like, th there was a huge negative sentiment out of that stuff. But I think even people that were a little more reasoned um, watching it were, were kind of like a little off put by some of the things here. Oh, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say that there were, there's some people that were, some people were interested in a game called conquered concord. It is a, uh, multiplayer competitive shooter from firewalk studios. 
Uh, this is a team of folks. Uh, found it was it was founded by some ex Bungie folks. Um, and uh, Conquered looks like kind of a hero shooter, and most of what they showed was a lot of like the characters quipping at each other in a very guard like they they had a very Guardians of the Galaxy on a budget kind of look. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the in-game stuff they showed was like, oh, okay, yeah, you kind of look, looks like you looks like you're kind of making a hero shooter here. Uh, it is a five V five game. Uh, they announced this game last year, but this is kind of the first time they really kind of showed gameplay on it. And I, I don't know, man. I saw like, over the last week, I saw someone complaining, and, and this is something that I think happens in a lot of different uh, segments of the internet. We could call them various fandoms, if you will, but it is definitely a, a, a topic of discussion that has dominated wrestling discussion for a good long time. It's something that you start to see a lot more in movies. It is something that we see a lot more in games now. And that is that a lot of the discourse around these games becomes focused on will the game be a success or not? What will it do sales figure wise? What will it do? And, and, you know, someone was lamenting like, man, it used to just be that I could go to the movies and watch a movie and like a movie and not have to give a shit about what it means for the franchise. And, oh, did it have a good opening weekend or, or whatever else? And that, and that so much of the discussion of films are centered around that, that it's, garbage um and wrestling of course uh if you've been listening to this show you've probably heard me beat this drum a little bit before but there are people uh when it comes to discussing wrestling that really only care about what the television ratings which is something that most of the people discussing them don't understand them a single bit uh which is always fun um and i'll say you know like that is something that is definitely come that that has been a part of discussion around games for a long time as well but i might say that video games are the one spot where that discussion becomes meaningful because when it comes to concord you're gonna have to make a decision the game's out in august pc and ps5 um i'm gonna see if they launched a a page on steam for it yet no they have not um because these are multiplayer games, but like we've all seen games come and go like that Rumbleverse, you know, games that launch seem promising. And then, you know, Oh, by the way, this is going offline. Um, or, or games that make it a couple of years, hyperscape, you know, games that, that come out and, uh, just don't attract a player base. And it's very hard. Like if you're, especially when these games are not free to play, that's a conversation that we kind of have to have. Do you think that, you know, if, if I'm going to invest and whether that's time or whether that's straight up money in the case of a game that's not free to play, if I'm going to go out and invest potentially $60, $70 in a multiplayer focused game, um, and, and maybe Conquered is free to play, I, I literally don't know. I don't know that they've said one way or the other. Um, my guess is it's not. That's that's like kind of off the top of my head, looking at the production quality of what they made. And I think if they were going to be, yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, they talked about pre-orders. So if, if they're talking pre-orders, then of course it's not free to play. Um, unless they're just going to sell founders packs or something like that in some kind of weird backdoor kind of thing. But yeah, they're, yeah, they're taking fucking pre-orders. So... If you're going to order that game, you have to think about it. Like it's a 5v5 multiplayer game. If you go like, are, are there going to be other people playing this game six months past release? Or is it going to tank? And am I going to hate it and move on to another thing? Will there be an, another game that comes along, you know, a month or two later? Like Call of Duty Black Ops 6, uh, you know, that I will, that I will go for instead and, and leave this thing in the dust. What is the proposition? What is the value proposition? Like it, it just, it, it, like I said, in games, it's a very different conversation when it, when you have to rely on other people 
to even play a game in the first place, let alone enjoy it or, or whatever, you need to be playing games with healthy player bases. And so players of video games are forced then to have like some version of this conversation, right? If, if they're really thinking these things through before they purchase them, they have to go like, well, you know, is, is this something that people are going to like, am I going to spend a bunch of time getting good at this? And then, and then no one's going to play it ever again. Like what happened to the people that really devoted themselves to battle born, you know, all seven of them. Um, Evolve is another great example. Yeah, we, we've had so many examples of multiplayer first or multiplayer only games that have shipped over the last decade or so that, um, that were not free to play, that, that you were in, in a situation where you're just like, well, I did like this game, but I can't play it anymore. Yeah, are people still playing Back for Blood? Maybe, I don't know. Like maybe if you play at the right time, there's probably a discord of people you could track down a back for blood discord with, but like all of those people are all super good at the game. So if you're not, you know, you're already at this extreme disadvantage. Yeah. Exo primal, another great example of a game that, you know, if you're going to invest in exo primal and I think it's on game pass, I think exo, exo primal launched on game pass, didn't it? Um, You know, who else is playing that? Are they going to stick with it? Is it going to be worth your time? Are you going to have fun with friends? And, and the free to play nullifies much of this, right? Because, um, well, foam stars launched on PlayStation plus, but it was not free to play per se, but it was, it was on PlayStation plus at launch. And so you at least had a situation there where you go like, Oh, you know, I've got my two friends and we're going to go play this or however is it? It's not three V three. It's however many people are on the team. <clears throat> and so I think it's forced players to at least um, consider the the economics or, or at least the potential success rate of a game pre-release because they have to make these decisions based on you know like oh is, is are me is me and my friend group are we gonna are we gonna buy Conquered and and, and then play a bunch of it or, or are we gonna play it for a week and then be angry that we spent our money on this thing and then go right back to playing. I don't know what, what, you know, Fortnite or, you know, whatever, whatever other bigger game that they're still into. Um, it's just kind of the reality of the situation. Right. Uh, and so I think in, in video games, especially in, uh, particularly in multiplayer video games, I think that that version of the conversation does hold merit and it's annoying, right? Cause you don't want to have to sit there and go like, well, is this game going to, you know, but, but it's become part of it. I think even in the case of free to play games, you know, like a lot of the discussion around X Defiant is like, are you going to really, are you going to invest a bunch of money on X Defiant cosmetics? Do you, are you going to get the use out of that? Do you like that game enough? Like maybe you do and you'll, you'll feel like whatever, but like how long is X Defiant going to last? I don't mean to talk doom and gloom about it yet again, but I like, you know, Black Ops 6 is going to come out at some point. It will probably do well unless they really shit the bed on it, which is entirely possible. Um, but, you know, is that thing going to have legs? Is that thing going to gonna be the first person shooter for the next five years, for the next two years, for the next, you know, six months? Or is it just a game that came out in the summer and you're going to play it until Black Ops 6 came out and then you're never going to think about it ever again? I think for a lot of players, it will fit into that category. Not all of them, but whatever. But, you know, you, you... It's frustrating, but again, I, I think that these conversations end up having to... It ends up having to happen, you know? Um, and so I look at Conquered, uh, and... I, I should watch it again and see if they ever say the word con they must call it Concord because you wouldn't just call it Concord. But because of Concord, California, I see that word, I think Concord. Ugh, Concord. They used to have a good mall. Probably don't anymore. God of War Ragnarok's coming to PC in September. 
Uh, there were a handful of third party games there, like Dynasty Warriors Origins, which is out in 2025. I think it's really funny the idea of them naming a game Origins, considering how many of those games have kind of repeated different aspects of the same historical conflicts. Not to say that they're all identical and telling the same story over and over again, but there's just something audacious about all that. <clears throat> um, Infinity Nikki will have a beta test sometime uh, between July and September, according to Eurogamer's recap of all this. Uh, that's uh, you dress up a lady. It's, it's pretty. You dress up a pretty anime lady. Lady looks real good. Looks real good. Um, a couple of VR games were uh, were shown: Behemoth and Alien Rogue Incursion. Alien will be out in the holiday season. They showed very little of it, and what they did show of Alien, the frame rate was not finished. They didn't. Uh, hey, give them credit; they didn't fake it for the trailer. But also, there's no way that game could run like that on release without making everyone sick. Um, Marvel Rivals is coming to console. That was officially confirmed during this thing, which I. Of course it is. <laughs> like, what? Oh. Like, it was a weird thing to announce. And then they sent out a press release saying, like, yeah, it's also coming to Xbox. And you're like, yeah, no shit. Oh, is that not announced? Like, okay. Well, sure. Of course it is. Um, They showed the Silent Hill 2 remake, and that looked like butt. Uh, Monster Hunter Wilds looks pretty good. And then they, uh, they showed Astro Bot. Which was, uh, you know, that's been rumored for a little bit here. Um... They're making a new Astrobot game. I think some people have done some interviews with this team since then, and I've seen some numbers being bandied about saying like it's four times as big as the PlayStation 5, uh, the Astrobot's Playroom pack-in. Um, it looks wonderful. It looks, it looks, it looks like a wonderful time. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to playing Astrobot. I think that was the the only first party thing in this that looked straight up awesome and was straight up exciting uh i mean conquered was really the only other new thing here um <clears throat> over 80 worlds is what it's being billed as uh it'll have a bunch of characters in it that will kind of evoke or uh or, or at least be references to the history of playstation there was a parappa astrobot shown in the trailer. Um, and it looks great. It looks like a nice, bright, colorful platformer uh, that, you know, the, like I said, when we were watching it, you don't get a ton of these anymore. No one, you know, not a lot of people make these anymore. You know, we're, we're it feels like we're just about due for a new Mario game. Um, eh, maybe not quite. I mean, they probably don't launch with one. Uh, but yeah, Astrobot looked fantastic. But yeah, I mean, you know, it was a, a batch of third-party games, um, you know, and and them opening with with Conquered uh, really seemed to be somewhat deflating. At least the the view I had on it, watching live like three different live chats at the same time while we were talking about it, people seemed <laughs> they were not fucking having it, and I I am with them. I don't think that game sold itself very well uh, with what they showed of it. And maybe that will, maybe that will be an amazing game when they put it together. I mean, you know, like I think people look at it and think like, oh, is this just kind of like another overwatch? Is this like, what, what, what are we actually looking at here? And um, we'll see how that ends up. You know, you've got powers and abilities and, and, and whatever else. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. That's out in the summer. That's not, that's, that's, uh, it's out end of August. So not that far off. And then Astrobot's right around the corner. That's like September 6th. Yeah. So not a, not a great showing. This is, I think, you know, that when, when Arthur was uh, on the show uh, last week before this thing had aired and we were both kind of talking about like, yeah, you know, Sony... Sony's lineup feels a little weird and, and they had already said in a financial call that they were not going to have 
um, big games that were for the rest of this fiscal year. I think Concord was the only thing that they kind of hung their hat on in that, of that financial call and said that they, they had that. Um, yeah, feels like a, a, a weird year for PlayStation. Um, it's been, we've had several weird years out of Xbox at this point. It's just, it's just a, like I said, coming into the summer games fest, it, it's, it's a weird, it's weird right now. Um, it was not announced during their showcase, but a couple of days later, meaning yesterday, the PlayStation blog updated with information on the PC adapter for the PlayStation VR two. Um, <clears throat> This will allow you to use your PSVR 2 on a PC and use it to play PC games. That said, the method by which you will do this, I will say, is a little less than ideal. Uh, there were hackers that were taking a look at the, the PSVR 2 stuff and trying to figure out how they could hook it up to a PC. And the, the thing that they realized is like, oh, you're going to need a USB-C port on your graphics card, which... NVIDIA has not put one of those on their cards for a couple of generations now because it's a it's a concept that kind of did not catch favor or did not catch on, and, and so it sort of went away. Um, and so they were saying it was going to be a very big uphill climb to, to get that working. What Sony is doing is they are going to sell you a breakout box uh, that you will hook it up to, and you it also has a display port adapter on it. So you will need to plug into a display port on the back of your PC. I think all of my display ports are full. Of, I don't Well, I don't know. And now that I'm, I, I put the 4090 in, I don't actually remember how many ports that thing has in the back of it. Maybe it does have more, but I currently use three display port, um, ports for my three monitors. I could always switch one over to HDMI, I suppose, but also no, um, the other catch with this is that it, uh, they are saying that the, a lot of the features that made the PSVR 2 unique or, or made it kind of stand out are not going to work on PC, such as HDR, uh, headset feedback, rumble in the headset, eye tracking, the adaptive triggers on the controllers, and other types of haptic feedback. It, it just says are not available when playing on PC. It doesn't say like games will need to be updated to support that. It just says is not available. That is their, their language. Um, <clears throat> which I assume means that like whatever. So this, this adapter, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at pictures of, of the, the breakout box. It does have a USB port on it. Um, so yeah, it, it looks like you will need a display port adapter and USB. There's a third cable coming out of the back of it though. Yeah, I don't know. They, they show it with a third cable coming out and I don't know what that would be. Um, Setup is easy. Simply connect PSVR 2 to your PC using the adapter and the DisplayPort 1.4 cable. Then download the PSVR 2 app and the Steam VR app from Steam. This will allow you to set up PSVR 2 on your PC, customize settings and play area, and start playing games. Hmm. Yeah, maybe it needs to be powered. Maybe it needs to. It, maybe it needs to be powered separately. Um, to power the headset as well, you know, because the headset just plugs into the front of it via USB. Uh, it will use Bluetooth for the, I assume, the controllers. Hmm. It will still have 4K visuals, 2000 by 2040 per eye, 110 degree field of view, finger touch detection, see through view, and foveated rendering without eye tracking. So maybe that's a USB bandwidth thing and the, the stuff that they need to transmit to the headset is they couldn't or just didn't want to make that work. I don't know. Um, I guess long story short, 
I think this changes or, or this, this makes my recommendation for all of this. If you are looking to buy a VR headset to use on your PC, the PlayStation VR two headset is not the one you should buy. Um, <clears throat> but if you already own a PSVR two and you want to ever use it for anything, this is probably your best bet. It's a solid extra. Yeah. If you already have one, this expands the functionality on it. I mean, you saw at state of play, they showed two VR games, both of them, third party games. They have shut down at least one of the studios responsible for developing VR games for them in house. It is hard to envision a scenario where Sony first party uh, really gets behind PSVR 2 ever again. In fact, I might go so far as to say that maybe they will never make another first party PSVR 2 game ever again. Um, but we will see. Um... Maybe they do still have one or two things in the works. It's hard to say, but, but I don't, I, it would not shock me if we never saw another one point being, um, this is, yeah, I don't know this, this is, they, they, uh, and the price of the, did they say the price It is coming out August 7th? The box will be $60. Um, Yeah. I don't know, man. The say what you will about the Quest uh hardware, and I have not used a Quest 3. Um but I found the wireless connectivity that it offered to be uh really wonderful. And it works quite well with playing PC stuff, and you have the added benefit of it running a bunch of games. Uh, natively directly on the headset itself. And so even though I think there are things about PSVR 2 that are probably better from a specs standpoint or whatever, the missing features when you hook it up to a PC, the eye tracking and some of this other stuff really mutes that advantage. Um, and then suddenly you're like, well, you know, hey, I've got a cable and now I've got all this other stuff. Like, again... If you have a PSVR 2, you should probably get one of these boxes, I guess, and then you'll have more things to use it for. Which is insane, but I it just... I feel like if you needed a sign, uh, or like a really good check-in on kind of where VR is at, the last year of uh, watching PSVR 2 launch and kind of just not really getting follow-ups there. They even use, you know, it's funny. It's funny because people kept saying like, oh, they're going to announce Half-Life Alex for PlayStation. They're definitely going to do it. Of course they're going to do it. Um, the image that they put up for this <laughs> uh, showing the PSVR 2 connected to a PC and all that stuff, they have a monitor and, and the Half-Life Alex logo is on the monitor. <laughs> um, so there you go. Half-Life Alex on PSVR 2. Finally, the time is now. Um, yeah. Uh, I was talking to a guy, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, a friend, a handyman, that uh, was in here doing some stuff and, and talking about VR with him a little bit because I think he had bought... Maybe he had bought a Quest 2. I forget. What, no, he, he had an Index. He ended up getting an Index. So he, he kind of went all the way. Um, <clears throat> and he kind of, I, I think he, he mirrored some of the same stories that I think everyone has been saying of just like, oh yeah, I, I got it. And I used it a lot for the first couple of weeks there and I haven't really come back to it. So I, yeah, I don't know. Hard to imagine VR suddenly catching on at this stage in the game. It'll continue to exist and it'll be really good for specific use cases. Yeah, sim racers, people that want to do all of that stuff. If you are into um, 
specific types of pornography and uh, sim racing, which that's that Venn diagram is a single circle. Um, then uh, VR is for you. Um, VR chat's really neat. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of neat stuff. Like, there's a ton of neat, neat stuff. <clears throat> Jeff Keighley was out on the internet last week. Uh, he was streaming on Twitch, taking questions about the upcoming Summer Games Fest show. Summer Game Fest show. Singular. Uh, which is going to be broadcasting uh, in a few days here. On, on Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific. I will be here sitting in this chair watching it with my eyes and talking about it with my mouth. If you want to come here and watch it, I filled out a form that says that I'm an official co-streamer. So, uh, yeah. I think that means I get a zip file with some logos in it. Motherfucking... Um, anyway, Jeff Keighley was, was out on... Uh, out on Twitch streaming, taking some questions uh, about the show. And he said the thing that I think he's been saying about his last few shows, and no one ever seems to remember that. Um, but he kind of, but this has led to headlines about him tempering. Well, the Video Games Chronicle head, headline is responsible. It's a summer game fest largely focused on announced games coming this year. Uh, there's some quotes from him here that says, one of the things you'll see with the show this week is we really tried to program some unexpected things from smaller teams and independent studios into the show as well, alongside some big blockbuster games and franchises that you will see in the show as well. I think it's going to be generally a little bit quieter this summer in terms of crazy new announcements and shocking surprises and things like that. There will definitely be new announcements, but the show is largely focused on, I think, existing games that have new updates for fans just in terms of level setting. So he's out there trying to kind of set expectations, which never works because people always, and, and people were in his chat going like, well, what about Kingdom Hearts 4? To which he said that people that are expecting Kingdom Hearts 4 are, quote, setting themselves up for failure. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, people will never learn when it comes to this stuff. People will never set their expectations properly, even with, even with the producer of the show out there saying as much, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know, um, he said that there will not be a GTA six trailer here. He did say there will be an update on pal world, uh, metaphor re Fantasio will be there and Capcom will show more of monster hunter wilds. Um, uh, mm. There's other stuff in the show, obviously, and he's he's not you know he's not fully tipping his hand here about stuff that's in the show. But yeah, this is this is kind of this is the vibe that has come out of everything that I've been booking appointments for, and 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 a lot of the stuff has been like, yeah, there's there's going to be some stuff. People will be excited about that stuff if they take it at face value, but people coming into this expecting like massive. E3 level brand new announcements. Now keep in mind, he's speaking specifically about the summer games fest showcase his, his individual show on Friday. This is not necessarily him talking about what Xbox will show at their thing. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, well, you know, we'll probably, I imagine we will see some things for the first time at the Xbox thing. We will probably get some new announcements. Um, I don't know. We, we talked about it a little bit last week, but you know, are they going to, are they going to get out there and talk up gears? Uh, M bowls in the chat says Microsoft has been pretty quiet about hyping their show this year. I think, I think Microsoft is smart enough to know that like they need to just fucking have a good show. And they need to let that show speak for itself. And they need to get games out. Getting out there and talking about like, this is the biggest, they've, there's, there has been a little bit of this, but that this is the biggest number of games and exclusives that we've ever brought to our summer showcase event in terms of world premieres. You're only going to see gameplay. Everything runs on real hard. 
like in, to in terms of like making a bunch of bold claims about what they're going to be showing um no you know they 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 should probably if they have good things to say about their upcoming lineup they need to say that stuff they need to not like they need to not oversell it they should probably just not sell it at all just be like hey come watch our show and and try to maintain um at least the appearance of being humble about this stuff you know they have revealed that like their after show thing is call of duty and that's that is a big deal you know as, as much as people as much as everyone loves to shit on call of duty having the next call of duty and then devoting a, a big chunk of time to it that will be interesting to see um But yeah, is it going to be gears? Is it going to be, you know, like what, you know, what are they going to, are they going to show more of fable? Like there's just a variety of things that feel like they should be already out with the amount of years that have gone into them already. Like it just, it just feels like some of these games should be out or, or they should be showing significant chunks of gameplay and, and whatever else uh, of a thing that is right around the corner. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, uh, for Keeley's part, he is saying that, that his show, um, yeah, there will, there will, this show is very much largely focused on announced stuff. There are absolutely new game announcements throughout the show, but just to level set, it's not all brand new stuff. It tends to be things that are coming out later this year. So, so yeah, um, I think that's fine. Cause I think there are enough games on the books that, you know, I, I want to know what's coming out this year because I feel like we, it's, there's just been weird setting the stage for what is, what the rest of 2024 is going to look like, I think is, is totally valuable because I think that stuff's been, it, it, it just feels murky, but I don't think we'll get, you know, N Nintendo is, is traditionally not a huge part of a showcase like this. Um, and maybe they'll have their own event a little later in the summer or something. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like that's like, they're, they're in, they're in a weird spot with their stuff. So we'll see what they have to say whenever they finally want to talk about it. And, um, yeah, a, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of murky murk in video games right now. Not a ton of clarity. So we'll certainly have more clarity about the rest of this year coming out of the weekend. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's my, my expectations for the rest of the year are weird. They're, they are weirdly flat right now. Uh, it's just, I'm, I'm just, I'm in, a, I'm in a very weird, I'm in a very weird headspace about the, current realities of upcoming video games just to just yeah i don't know it's like multiverses there's a weird sludge all over it um you know speaking of call of duty black ops 6 uh they are starting to show little bits and pieces about the game they're injecting them those bits and pieces into the current call of duty game um, there's like a cut scene that is occasionally playing for people, you know, there and people aren't quite sure what makes the cut scene play, but someone did capture it and throw it online. Um, and it shows Frank Woods in a wheelchair, um, which is how black ops two, if you remember black ops two was set in the future and, um, and in the past, like they're, they're, they had some flashback stuff in there. And so in the future sequences, Frank Woods was depicted as uh, being in a wheelchair. I guess it, and by the future, I mean, it was the future then. And I guess now it is far less futuristic than, than it is. So by this time, uh, Frank Woods would be in a wheelchair. Um, or by the, with the 90s story that they seem to be telling, they will have him in the wheelchair at this point. And so... That's leading to people starting to connect dots around like, okay, that means that the the parts of Black Ops 2 are canonical. So that means that this guy is not around. And and there were two endings in Black Ops 2. Um, 
that determined whether Alex Mason, the man of the numbers, is alive or not. Presumably he's still alive. Because why would you kill him off? Um, and that's interesting. I don't know. Like the the it, it, All this did was remind me that the campaign in Call of Duty Black Ops 2 was fucking cool. And that they have not done anything like that since. Um, there were gameplay changes. There were storyline changes that would happen in that game depending on like, did you shoot this guy in the legs or in the head? Or did you shoot this guy or did you shoot next to this... Did you act like you shot him um, and pretend to kill him so that he could live on? Like there, there are, there was a bunch of weird stuff in that game that was incredibly ambitious for its time and they never did it again. They never did it again. Uh, and that's a damn shame because that was a, such a cool idea. Like the ideas they had in the Black Ops 2 campaign uh, were fascinating. <coughs> And uh, it's a it's a real shame that they never really followed up on that stuff. Um, and so it, it's nice in a weird way to have like this game be wrapping back around to reference elements from that game. And we'll see where it all goes and, and how it all pans out, of course. But um, but that has left me tentatively excited. The idea that like, oh, that, that this stuff is going to kind of be revisited a little bit. And this guy Adler, who was in um, Black Ops Cold War pretty prominently is maybe now a fugitive. He's like the Robert, Robert Redford esque guy from, from that game. If you remember, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see where they go with that stuff simply because the, the black ops two stuff was, was really fascinating. Um, and that's going to do it for news. I, you know, actually, I, IGN's got a story about Private Division. Um, you know, there were stories recently about Take Two shutting down um, Roll Seven and some other studios, um, which Strauss Zelnick got out there and said, "Like, we're not shutting down those studios," but it's like seemingly they have also notified Washington State that those things are going to be shutting down. So I don't, I don't, it's uh yeah, I don't know. I don't know what game they're playing over there with that stuff. Um, but IGN is reporting that uh, take two is looking to offload its entire, that entire division, the private division, they spun up private division as kind of a publishing, a new publishing arm um, that would kind of work in the indie space a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but maybe also be a name that they could put onto some of their own games, whether it was like the new mafia ends up being a private division release or, or whatever they want to do with it. Um, it, it was, it was a little unclear uh, what the full scope of that label was going to be, but generally speaking, it was a division that they used to put out um, smaller kind of indie, indie level stuff. Um, now there is talk that the 2k is looking or take two rather is looking to get that entire division gone. Um, according to IGN, um, in February, employees were told that layoffs were imminent, but not given any specifics. And then at the end of April, employees at the label were told, were told by management that take two would no longer support private division at which time the, almost the entire staff was laid off. <clears throat> uh, they do have a small crew in place again, according to IGN's reporting, uh, to handle the deals that they have. Uh, they're publishing No Rest for the Wicked uh, by Moon Studios, which is in early access. Uh, Tales of the Shire from Weta Workshop and something from Game Freak. Um, <clears throat> and they backed out of a couple of other publishing deals, one of which was with Bloober Team. Um... And so, yeah, it looks like they're looking to maybe sell off the Kerbal Space Program IP and that there's a private equity firm who is potentially interested in acquiring private division. Um, yeah. It's, it sounds like a mess. It sounds like a very weird mess. I, private division was... was uh, I, like, I don't know that they ever did enough... Like, they... There are a handful of games that had that private division label attached to them. 
And it never really felt like Take Two was was fully behind that, or or that it was never meant to be this this lar- a very large thing. And so, um, if you're selling it off, I'm not sure what you're selling. If you've laid off most of the people, because it's a, if it's a publishing operation for indie games, that needs talent and money, and that's it. Talent who can provide value to indie publishers. You know, why why would an indie publisher choose to be published by someone like Private Division as opposed to just self publishing? For example, what does a publisher offer in this day and age is sort of uh, a question that is getting asked more and more lately. Um, <clears throat> and so if you've laid off most of the people at private division, um, what are you, what are you peddling? What are you actually selling at that point? Because it's the people who would know how to get interest in a game, whether that's through PR efforts or marketing or whatever, like, you know, is there, if there actually is know-how other than that, all the publisher can offer is money. Like, Hey, we'll, you know, you give us X percent of your game when it sells and we will give you the money you need to finish it and we will help you market it. Right. I mean, otherwise why are they, you know, why are they there? Um, so that's, it's a weird, it's, that's weird. It's weird. Let's get into some emails. <clears throat> my allergies are straight up garbage. I am my my throat is a mess right now. I am um um str- struggling a little bit here today. So let's get into some emails. Uh, the past couple of days, like I thought, like am I sick? What the fuck is going on? Like I thought for sure that I had a cold. And then I woke up and the, you know, and I took some Benadryl before going to bed one night. And then I was just fucking spun and I couldn't sleep and I was a mess. And it was just, I was just super weird all night long. Um, woke up at basically like 1245 and couldn't get back to sleep for the rest of the night. It was, it was real. And then the whole next day I was fucking crazy. I was just like in a funk, in a fog, just in a, it was, I was I was all fucked up yesterday. I was all fucked up yesterday. But, uh, and today I am less fucked up, but I, my throat and my nose and everything are still shitty. So, so that's been fun. Um, so if that informs the number of emails I take today, just know, uh, I'm fucking, it's, it sucks over here right now. Um, <clears throat> uh, James sends this in on a local Facebook gaming group. A member posted a rumor that potentially a spawn game was in development from a new studio called hundred star, which features some ex rocksteady people. That's true. Hundred star is the new studio, um, from uh, like Sefton Hill and, uh, some of the other, you know, the rocksteady folks that left went to go start a new thing that that part is hundred hundred the hundred star part of that is true um my comment to this was do younger people even know who spawn is certainly my two teenage kids don't and i'm somebody who really liked spawn in the 90s but i'm 44 for which i was yelled down feverishly that it's still always in the top 50 comics which again i thought is that even big with kids these days Anyway, do you think a new spawn game would make much of a dent out there? I feel like if a skin was in Fortnite, it would at least give some sort of new audience, but I don't know how successful a full game could be. Uh, and that's uh, Jim from the Gold Coast, Australia. Um, yeah, I don't, spawn. I so I I have always thought that. Um, yeah, spawn, man. Who cares about Spawn? I think that I don't. I think the people who all the who who really, 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 really cared about Spawn back when Spawn was popular were not trustworthy individuals, generally speaking. You know, like Spawn was just that like dumb, edgy '90s stuff. Just from the outside looking in, as someone who was never really that into the character or or like followed any of the comics or anything like that. Like, I'm sure they told stories that, you know, resonated with some people on a real level. Like, whatever. It's fine. But the idea of, like, anyone caring about Spawn in 2024, yeah, man, I don't... 
but you know, if that game comes out and it's rated M, it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be played by your two teenage kids anyway. So there's probably room for a, you know, if you're doing a right sized budget and, and a proper scope, you can make a spawn game. Why not? And that Dreamcast game was kind of neat. That like arcade game thing they did. Um, but yeah, dude, spawn. Yuck. Uh, Jonah from Columbus writes in and says, my friends and I created a bingo card for Summer Game Fest and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, I know that the David Cage Star Wars game won't be there, but wouldn't that be funny? So I'll just read the things that are on this bingo card. Weird celebrity encounter. That seems pretty likely that there will be some celebrity there. Like, you know, you, you think about it um, in the quest to get some sponsorship money set against this thing. They will promote some Netflix thing and some guy will come out and go like, I'm on the new Netflix show. It's about space. And we, I love video games. Just ask me. Do you love video games? Yes, I do. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> Uh, Silk Song release date. I'm just going to say no. This is why. Uh, Resident Evil. I don't. I don't know. There was that that weird like retail leak or whatever that you know was claiming that RE9 was going to be a thing or something, and that there was a subtitle for it. But I I don't think so. Battlefield. I'm going to say no. A new Remedy game. Um. Maybe, maybe I'm going to say maybe, um, or a new, d new, new meaning what, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's like a brand new IP or anything like that, but like something new out of remedy, maybe like an Alan Wake DLC or something. Um, or maybe that Max Payne thing could show up. That's all. That's certainly possible. Um, Judas. Maybe. A uh, new Valve game. I with the the constant leaks uh the kind of constant leaks of this Valve thing that they're apparently play testing. Um I I feel like that would be a a good thing to be showing here, but I I don't I don't know. Valve is Valve, right? A 2XKO release date. No. I'm going to say no. Maybe we get like a... Uh, if they do show it at all... No, no. In fact, no. Uh, 2XKO is the, the uh, fucking poorly named fighting game from the League of Legends people. By the way. In case you have forgotten that that name is fucking garbage. Um... No, if they're going to do something with that, they'll do it at Evo because they want the credibility that comes with that. Um, Kojima game. Yeah, do you think we get a, a Kojima update? I could see it. But maybe he's off actually working on stuff right now and there's not much to, to really say. But, but yeah, I could see, you know, I could see them doing um, the Xbox game here. Or I guess maybe... Hmm. Yeah, maybe they could touch on the Xbox game here and then do a bigger segment on it in the Xbox showcase. I don't know. <laughs> There's a square here devoted to shitty Nexon MMO. I'll say yes, but in spirit. It, it, like the game might not be from Nexon, but it'll be a shitty Nexon MMO. If you know what I mean. <clears throat> uh, Star Wars Outlaws gameplay. I don't think so. I think that they'll Ubisoft will save that for their own thing, but they've they've double dipped before. So maybe they could do a, a tiny thing here and, and a bigger thing on their stage. <clears throat> uh, the word layoffs. Mm. I'm going to say probably not. The word cozy. Maybe. Someone says key three out loud. No. 
Uh, vampire survivors cross Castlevania. Didn't they already? Didn't they already do that? Um, one of those Sega retro reboots. Oh yeah, you know they maybe Sega could show have more to show on one of those games. I suppose that's possible. Hmm, maybe. Um, Arc System Works. Ah. I think they've shipped stuff too recently to maybe have anything quite ready. Uh, MGS3 Remake, I think that got shot down. I think Keeley might have shot down uh, Delta showing up there. Uh, Dragon Age Dreadwolf release date, maybe, maybe. Uh, Skate 4. Um... In the showcase, maybe, maybe, like if we're just talking about the video and not necessarily games that will be shown. Um, <clears throat> then I could see them maybe doing something with Skate Four, but I don't, I don't know what they like. They, they are, they are marketing on TikTok, like they're doing stuff with the new Skate already on social media, and they're showing clips of it. Uh, in ads and stuff, but it like, it doesn't look done at all. It's a bunch of like untextured wireframe boxes and stuff in a lot of, you know, like it's the stuff, the stuff that they've shown or a lot of the stuff that is leaked out. It's always looked weird. Uh, David Cage, Star Wars game. No need for speed. You know, I, I wonder if there will be some kind of significant EA presence at something like this because you know like they haven't announced anything in a little while but i i don't think i don't think they'll do need for speed um borderlands 4 and uh and jonah has put a frowny face on the bingo card next to borderlands 4 um i think it's too soon to announce but i do wonder if um take to buying um, Gearbox from Embracer, I think probably shifts production on Borderlands 4 up a little bit. Probably gets them to go like, hey, we want to get some money out of this thing we bought, so let's get to Borderlands 4. Um, but it, it's probably still too soon for them to show something. They probably show something on the movie, right? They probably They probably show a trailer for the movie. Uh, and then Astrobot is on here, which we know already happened, so probably not going to be shown there. Um, but yeah, so some decent, some decent picks in there, I suppose. Joe from Leeds writes and says, why don't they make car combat games anymore? Was the genre that shitty? I remember back in the PS one days when we had the twisted metal games, vigilante eight rogue trip, Carmageddon, Rock and Roll Racing 2, Red Asphalt, Grudge Warriors, and so on. Okay, the quality of these games varied wildly, but it just seems strange that a popular genre completely died a death. What gives? Um, I always think of it as um, when analog sticks became uh, much more the norm and once first person shooters really kind of latched on to modern consoles and modern console control schemes that the need for car combat kind of dropped off. You know, when you're looking at, um, a fully digital PlayStation controller with no analog sticks, <clears throat> you can't just stand there and turn easily as in a first person shooter, you know, like the controls at your disposal are limited. And so the idea of like a gas and a brake, and then you turning with a digital, with a D pad, like it just, I think it's, it's, it's easier to convey that style of gameplay than it was to convey first person shooters with that type of control. So as the control schemes evolved, I think the need for that type of game fell off, but also I think in a lot of ways that genre burned out. Um, the, the games that weren't twisted metal didn't really stick. Like everyone likes to talk about vigilante eight. Um, 
and Rogue Trip and some of that other stuff, but like they, those were games of the moment. Twisted Metal feels like it was the only franchise that that actually had some legs outside of that, you know. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think that that thing ran its course. I think that Twisted Metal just was, you know, people kind of woke up one day and said, "These guys are lame. This is all so corny. What the fuck? Why?" Um, but you know, then it became a, a new TV show. I, I, I f it's weird to me. And I, I know the story was that they tried. Um, but it does feel weird to me that they were, have been unable to get a new twisted metal game out, um, recently, you know, since they've been making it a TV show and, and all that sort of stuff. I suspect they will still try at some point, but I, but I think car combat is a thing. So the, the big problem with car combat is like. If you have guns on the front of your car, and this would happen if you had guns on the front of a real car too. You got to aim. You got to do like three point turn to aim your guns, you know, to, to aim your shot, line it up with someone else. You, you're always having to aim your shots at someone. And so, um, that sucks. It's not fun to do. Uh, it's like at, at this point, it would be more like you're playing a first person shooter with no strafing which is not fun or cool. Um, and if you put turrets on there, then it's like, okay, well, do the turrets auto aim? They, they did have some automatic uh, auto aiming weapons in Twisted Metal. Like the cop had his weird electrical thing. Um, <clears throat> but that stuff always kind of sucked too. Uh, here's the thing. Twisted Metal is terrible. But like at a time when the PlayStation was brand new and that style of game wasn't really, you know, we hadn't really seen a lot of it. I mean, the idea is top notch, right? Hey, we put guns on cars. You're like, fuck yeah. Yes. I've been wanting to put guns on my real car for years. I still do. Um, that is a very appealing concept, but in, but in practice, it's such a clunky mess. Um, it's just not fun. And I think the only way to really make it fun is to say, okay, these guns, these cars have turrets on them. And so you have a second player fucking lucky and wild style and that they are in a turret and they're the ones doing all the shooting. And then you're kind of driving, but like, you don't really have a good situational awareness situation of like, Oh, where do I need to go to not get shot? Um, and so I think the car combat in the big arena thing is super done. I do think that there's a limited, you know, like, you know, when we get to games like Mario Kart and Wipeout, which are, for all intents and purposes, the exact same game. Um, when you're on a racetrack, and so naturally you're going to have people in front of you and people behind you. And so you're going to have weapons that that, you know, that are shooting in those directions. I think that makes sense. Blur makes sense. Um, racing games with weapons makes sense, but that's a different thing. That's not car combat anymore. That's, you know, that's a racing game where you have guns or turtle shells, which is also a gun. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that the, the, that stuff still works. I, th I think that, you know, hey, we're dropping landmines on the track. We're dropping banana peels on the track. We're shooting machine guns out of the front. We're, you know, wh whatever it is, you know. Um, like racing plus weapons, I think, makes a ton of sense. But, again, it, it's because you're not having someone come up on your side and you're not having to deal with just like, oh God, someone I can't even see is shooting at me. What the fuck do I do? I can't even really turn. And I have no way to deal with this without stopping the car or turning around this way and trying to do that. It's, it's not fun. It's just not fun. John in Minnesota writes in and says, do you think a next gen Xbox controller um, chases the improved haptics and adaptive triggers of a modern PlayStation controller? Or do they try to one up that with something new? 
They put out a few surveys about this a while ago, but I never saw anything come of it, which I figure either means no one other than me cares, or they're saving it for the next hardware refresh. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, yeah, you know, we, we did see, yeah, the, you're right. There's been some surveys. Uh, there's been um, the idea of an updated controller back in those, those leaked decks from a while ago. Um, I think it would be cool if they matched the PlayStation controller feature for feature because it means more games on all platforms would take advantage of those functions. Right now, with that stuff really only being on PlayStation and sometimes PC games, PC ports of those PlayStation games, sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. Um... You, you need to have a more generalized support for those concepts across all versions to have some developers want to put in the effort to really take advantage of those haptics. And so I think that that, um, that would be a good bare minimum. If they go too far beyond that, you know, the only things I would like to see them do beyond, yeah, whether it's like full adaptive triggers or, or and, and better haptics, I think it would be cool to have some of the functionality that the elite controllers have, which they've done okay at, but you know, like I think hall effect sticks would be nice. Um, yeah. And some people would want a gyro in the controller, which I'm not, I'm, I'm too old for that. There are a lot of things I can adapt to a lot of new things I can still, uh, that I can still adapt to, but, um, uh, gyro controls is is maybe a bridge too far for me at this point. Um, <clears throat> but yes, I, I would love to see them at least achieve parity with the PlayStation controller simply to encourage more developers to support those um, that level of haptics and that level of feedback. I think that would be cool. That would be good for everybody if they did that. Um, going beyond that, it's like, what do you do? Are you going to add buttons? Are you going to, you know, what do you... As much as I would love to have six buttons on the face um, of a mainstream controller, the Xbox is never going to be your lead console for fighting games anyway, so it's sort of not as impactful if they do it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Kyle in Austin writes and says, Where and what was your arcade scene while growing up? Mine was mainly a local fast food burger place that had Mortal Kombat 1 and NBA Jam and managed to get a VF2 cabinet before it burned down and became a Dairy Queen. Uh, second place was the Shell Station down the road, which had time killers. My mom didn't like it because teen kids sold weed out the back. I played Samurai Showdown 2 at the Walmart. Yeah. I mean, you know... <clears throat> There were three or four arcades within driving distance of me when I was a kid in the, um, in the eighties, let's say, I was going to say in the early eighties, but you know, it's, it's early to probably more like 88, 89. Um, no, you know what? Into the nineties, into the nineties, Dodge city was still in Petaluma. Um, but it had gotten a lot smaller by the time fighting games got big and they had shifted over to a, a time model where you paid uh, by the hour to go into the arcade. But then when Mortal Kombat 2 came out, they set that game out front and charged quarters for it. It was not part of the timed thing. And that was frustrating. Um, but no, there, there were a few big arcades. Um... In the, in the immediate area, there was one in the Santa Rosa Mall. There was Aladdin's Castle there. And they just all, they all had different games. And so because we lived in Petaluma, we would normally go to Dodge City because that was the one in Petaluma. But sometimes, you know, if I could convince my dad to take a longer drive, uh, we would go to one of the other ones. Um, and that was always cool. Because uh, they just, you know, they had different games. They were smaller in a lot of cases, but it was, it was, nice, to, it was nice to play something else for a change. Um, And then, you know, when fighting games got big, it was really like 
the bowling alley had a decent little arcade that had a, a that that kept pretty current on fighting games. Uh, Scandia is a mini golf place that was in the area, and they were they had a pretty good arcade. Um, and it was just like you know there was a Seven Eleven. A friend of mine from high school worked at a Seven Eleven, and he worked weekends, and I would go hang out. Um, I would go hang out with him. Uh, and he passed away recently. I just found out. Um, but I, I would go hang out with him on the, like the Friday and Saturday nights that he was working and I would play like super street fighter two and total carnage. And then we would hang out in the, uh, in the cooler <laughs> sometimes and just, uh, you know, just, just fucking hang around. Um, and, and that was, that was cool. I don't know. He would work until like two or three in the morning. And so I would just go down there with a bunch of quarters and just hang out. Um, <clears throat> playing Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat 2 by yourself is a fucking bummer, though. <laughs> like, it was like no one else was hanging out with me that was playing the games. And so it was just like, I got really good at beating the AI in Mortal Kombat 2 with every single character. That was, that was, that was about it. So, um, yeah. Uh, Bill writes in with the, you know, we, we've answered this question before, but just, you know, to underscore it a little bit, I guess. Um, Bill writes in and says, I was around for the video game crash of 1983 and have my Dio records to prove it. Jump to today where there is nothing that I, as a gamer, am really looking forward to or am excited about. Between this common feeling and the feeling that we just had a very lackluster Sony state of play, do you think another crash is coming? Have the suits killed it again? No, no, not at all. Um, the crash, the thing about the video game crash that everyone needs to remember that, you know, like it, as, as it's been kind of the, the mythology around the video game crash um, paints it as this all encompassing thing that took the entire video game business down with it. It, it didn't, it, it, uh, it took the Atari 2600 down. It took the ColecoVision and, and some of the other, uh, console platforms of the day down because the 2600 crashed hard because Atari made bad business decisions and they flooded the market with games that no one wanted too many copies of cartridges that, you know, no one could sell. And so they all got deep discounted. So people bought like two dozen games for 30 bucks uh, when retailers were just blowing this shit off the shelves and it all kind of fell apart in the United States for consoles. Computers never really impacted that. And overseas, you know, this is when we get into some of the really interesting bedroom development that, that made the UK such the gaming powerhouse that it became. Um, when I talk shit about, you know, like when I, when I, when I kind of poke fun at like the kind of UK game design aesthetic, when we're playing NES games, um, it's because it feels out of place on the NES, not because I'm against it. If anything, I, I fucking, I love that that shit, shit exists. I love that it feels so different from a lot of other games that were coming out at the time. Um, and where it led to, I think that stuff is tremendous, you know? Um, <clears throat> Cause it's just a, such a specific flavor, but like that stuff was coming out all the time and, and, and computers were still a major factor. And if you were playing computer games in the United States, that shit never slowed down. And so I just started, that's a big part of like, at some point I stopped playing Atari games, but I, I had an Atari home computer, you know, I had an Atari 800. Um, I, I didn't have a 2600 until years later. Um, and then I got a Commodore 128 and I, I just, I just kept on computing, baby. The other thing to remember is that that happened over the course of like two fucking years, three years. Um, or if we look at it in a more worldwide fashion, like the Atari crash was like 1983 and then the Famicom came out in Japan, like the next fucking year. And it took them two or three years to get that back into the U S because retailers had cold feet, but it was not, it was not some big massive crash. Um, and so the idea of another crash coming now, like, no, like, like video games are still huge. For, I think that like, there's a correction that needs to happen. I think that, 
you know, they need to figure out a better way to make big games. A smarter way, a, a cheaper way, really, to make big games. And you see some CEOs fucking going like this, coming out from behind the tree every time AI gets brought up. Um, all excited because they think that that's a shortcut that they can use to make games uh, for less money. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think there's just a ton of like, I don't know, games spiral out of control in development all the time and cost way more money than it seems like they should. And, and you know, there are probably better ways to get productivity or, or better ways to meet your targets than to just straight up cut people out and replace them with something that's way worse right now. Um, like AI. Uh, but I think that, you know, we still do have this like undercurrent of smaller games that is, you know, in, in a lot of cases thriving. Think about it this way, you know, we've got a whole new market segment hitting over these last couple of years here with the steam deck. And now this, you know, the, the ROG ally, uh, they, they just, they are about to release or just, just revealed their updated hardware, but didn't say anything about if the new hardware would be better about not heating up so hot that the SD card pushes its way out of the slot like their original model did. Uh, I know they did do some internal redesign that I would hope would fix that, but um, those things are not going to be as powerful as consoles for a good long time as, as current consoles. As, and, and, and as we move into the next generation over these next couple of years here, we'll have another bump there as well. Um, and so there's going to be more and more people that get into that segment that will want games that run well on it, you know, and that doesn't mean that they want, you know, and, and sometimes that's as easy as optim optimizing your PC port to run on a wide variety of, uh, hardware. But sometimes that's a thing of like, oh, we're going to try to, uh, you know, make a game that's a little smaller, make a game that's a little easier to run on more systems because that means we can address more consumers. It's why people still make Xbox One and PS4 games is because they want to make games that as many people as possible can play. Um, and so, no, I don't think there's a crash coming. I think that like there's, there's something kind of dire about the biggest of the big games and those are the games that often get the most um, publicity because they are marketing the shit out of those games. <clears throat> But the industry is far larger than just that. Um, and so I think things will come out the other side. And, you know, I think right now, I think there's just, there's a bit of an identity crisis for what does it mean to be a big game? What, you know, how much can the market handle? Um, <clears throat> how many live service games can the market bear? Uh, because there are winners and losers in that space all the time. Uh, and what do they do about Fortnite? What do they do about Roblox, uh, Minecraft? You know, I, I think the, the industry still hasn't figured out a great answer for some of those questions, you know, where as people continue to play games, older games, old games like Fortnite, Minecraft is 15 years old, 15 fucking years old. That was just the anniversary they just had, right? That's nuts. Um, figuring out how to get your game in front of as many people as possible in the confines of, of that, of this current version of the industry, right? Like just putting out another massive big game for however much money, 60, 70, whatever, 110, whatever dollars it is these days. Um, you know, that isn't necessarily going to be enough. So how, how do the big publishers change their things up in ways to make them appealing to more people? Like that's the, ultimately that, that, that's the problem that has to be solved. And you see some companies scrambling, you know, you see suicide squad come along and you go like, Oh yeah, you guys really, you guys placed a lot of bets on this type of game at a time when that probably didn't seem as risky as it suddenly did uh, about halfway through development of that game. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, it's just there's a lot of a lot of stuff like that. So you know, I I wonder, you know, the 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 big supposedly final Destiny two expansion launches today. The final shape. Ten years. The ten year plan finally realized. Um. But they're going to have episodes and all this other stuff too. But does that mean at the end of that, they're going to really be done with Destiny 2? Will, uh, will those players be released back into the ecosystem and have to find a new home? Or will Bungie continue past the episodes and past the, you know, what, what will the next big thing from Bungie be? in that space, you know, it's probably not just marathon. Um, do they make a destiny three? They have another thing going, don't they? Is there, there's like another, there's something else on top of all that, right? <clears throat> you're saying that you're figuring that they're all going to go in on marathon. Well, you know, marathon will at some point be done. Um, and will they, they're not going to keep everybody all in on Marathon. I don't, I never got the impression that Marathon was meant to be that game. Um, but they're, but also because they've diversified a bit where there's another thing, there's another thing they have in the works, but then also do they end up doing more destiny down the line? I, I bet. Yeah, it, it, I, I bet to be, to be in that position of like, do I want to stay at this studio and figure out the future of destiny? Or do I want to finally put a bow on this thing and go do something else with my life? It's gotta be, um, an interesting decision. If, if, it, if it is indeed a decision that people there are making or, or will make over the next couple of years here, I guess. Um, but I could see that going both ways. Cause I bet if, if you could really, if you could wipe the slate clean with destiny, and say, we've learned so much over the last 10 years that the next thing we make that has the word destiny written on it is going to be from day one so much better managed. The, the internal mistakes with our build and rendering and like, uh, like just internal pipeline stuff that they probably look at now and go like, I can't fucking believe we have spent the last 10 years suffering through this specific thing. And if we're going to do this again for the sanity of the people who work here, we're going to fix this first. Um, so, cause I imagine, you know, like, like I, cause I'm, I'm the same way about anything, you know, anything that I've been involved in building over the years, it's always this feeling of like, man, if I had another crack at it now, there's definitely some stuff I would keep the same, but there's a whole fucking lot I would do super fucking differently. Um, And so I would be fascinated to see what that would look like if they were able to walk away from a lot of the legacy tech, uh, uh, the legacy of destiny Two, really like, yeah, burn it all down and be like, all right, clean slate. Here's our new thing. Here's our new destiny thing. Um, you know, what is that? And, and what do they do differently about the cadence of releases and how do they support it? And how do they find ways to, to keep it uh, fresh and relevant between expansions and 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 whatever else, um, I don't know. That would be interesting to see for sure. But I am going to play the new Destiny thing. Um, I'm I'm curious to see it. I'm curious to see what that thing is. Uh, I have enjoyed more of my time with Destiny than than I have not. But also I feel like I've been pretty smart over the last couple of expansions about knowing when to walk away from it and saying like, yeah, I don't, mm. nope, this is, this is not for me anymore. Uh, but, and, and I, I have not really kept up on the story and the lore and whatever else, but, but I do kind of want to see what they have to say this time around. Um, I read something saying they were deprecating legendary shards, which sucks because I've been, Fucking hoarding those for a real long time. <laughs> would I jump into a Destiny 3? Absolutely. I would, I would 
jump into anything that Bungie puts out at this point, at least at the start. <clears throat> I would, I would absolutely check it out. Like, why wouldn't, you know, yeah, like they have made some fucking wonderful video games over the years. Of course. Like, Hey, Hey, here's the new thing from Bungie. Do you want to see it? Yes. Yes, I do. I, I hope marathon is good. I'm still not sure what marathon is, <laughs> but I hope that marathon, uh, is good because I love the aesthetic of it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's tempting to say end of an era, but like, you know, with, with Bungie, with destiny, it's never quite over. You know, they still got a, a year or two of live service stuff to run with this expansion before they really have to, you know, get out there and talk about whatever's next. <clears throat> um, AJ from Boston writes in and says, Hellblade 2 is considered an impressive technical achievement, but some criticisms have been raised about its story and player interactivity. Some people seem to absolutely love it, while others seem to not care for it. This had me thinking about The Order 1886 from nine years ago. The Order was also considered a technical showpiece with a limited story and player interactivity. Uh, but the general conversation seems to be quite different, mainly that I don't remember anybody really liking the game at all. Is it just the passage of time, or is there something inherently different between these two games? Uh, also, how has how, how has the role of the technical showpiece changed over the last uh, decade? With how good so many games look nowadays, what do you even do now? Um, yeah, I remember the order being just kind of boring. Uh, that was kind of my, you know, it was it was like here's here's kind of a a dull cover shooter. Um, the story and characters don't really bring much to the proceedings. It looks nice. But even then, I don't remember it being something that was like incredible, like visually. I don't, I don't remember feeling like blown away by anything in the order. I remember going like, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I have played better cover shooters than this for sure. <clears throat> um, if there's something inherently different about those two games, I would say that like, it's that the order has more of a direct analog in terms of like it being a cover shooter of sorts. And so I think that at the time you had some people who were saying, or maybe trying to position it as like, this is PlayStation's answer to gears of war. Was it successful? Click here and find out that it had that kind of weird cookie sort of thing to it. If I remember right. Um, but I, yeah, I remember just being like a very average, like just kind of, just kind of whatever. Um, and I think Hellblade two doesn't necessarily have that direct analog. Like the Hellblade two is, is, you know, I think I compared it to rise a little bit, but it's not even quite that really. It, it's, a. Uh, <sighs> with Hellblade, there's a lot more walking. Um, and I think that it would be the more walking it has, the better it is, because I don't think that the combat in that game is especially engaging. And so if anything, the part where they make it a video game kind of detracts from it a little bit. Um, and as for the role of the technical showpiece over the last decade, um, I think you gotta, you know, you gotta pick fixed points in time and try to look at how that fixed point evolves from generation to generation. And that's why Triple H's hair was such a very, like, useful piece in video gaming for so long. Because, you know, every year another wrestling game would come out. Every year you could look at Triple H's hair and see if it has evolved at all. And if not, you go like, all right, well, maybe we'll get him next time, I guess. Um, that and how round the tires are in car games, <laughs> you know? Uh, can you see the polygons? Can you see the bumps in these car models and in these tires, you know, or not? But that kind of got solved a while ago. I hate to say it, but the tire, the tires are round. They are all the way round now. 
they did it. And I'm sure if we zoomed in far enough, we could probably still have this as a comparison point, but those tires, they look fucking great. Um, but car models were always the, you know, that, that was, that was always a very useful touch point as well, because those were things that existed in the real world. And so for better or worse, it became a thing you could look at and go like, yes, that looks like that car. Also, the light is reflecting off that car in ways that I identify as if that car was stand, standing here in front of me, that's how it would look there as well. Um, and so, yeah, the technical showpiece just means something different now. I think, you know, you could look at ray tracing and try to, and try to hang your hat on some of that stuff, but that's been so scattershot. It's been so even uneven in terms of support and in terms of implementation that ray tracing, I think has been a really bad indicator, uh, for technical prowess, uh, in, in a, in a game. Um, it's nice when it's done well. It's not nice when it's not done well. It's, you know, brilliant. These, thank you for listening to these brilliant insights. Um, there's still just a lot of stuff that you would think would be gone by now. That's the stuff that gets me is stuff that you look at as like, man, this was a problem on like the PlayStation one. And if you had told me that damn near 30 years later, we would be still be, if you told me that we would get to 2024 and that you put a Cheech and Chong model into call of duty and that his submachine gun floats on front of him by about nine inches because they couldn't attach it to the model or like or all the clipping issues that cloth and things and hair sometimes still has in, in some games. If you had told me that those things would still be happening in video games, I would be really bummed out. Because those are things that like you look at as problems from back then and you go like, man, it, it's, it's fucking insane that this is still with us that, that these issues are still with us. And you know, it's the sort of, it's, it's what it proves is that that's a fucking really hard problem to solve, you know, um, in a blanket way across the board in a game with a zillion different playable characters. I'm sure that I'm sure that if you sat someone down and said, I'm going to give you unlimited resources to solve this problem. And you have as much time as you need to make the gun look real when it is hanging off of Chong's shirt. I'm sure that an artist could get it done. I'm sure that, that it, a, a team could get that done. Um, but in a game where you're just churning through, like they announced the Gundam skins, and I'm sure that the Gundam skins will have all kinds of chunky armor and the guns will probably clip through them and all this other weird shit um, because they did animations for svelte dudes and then now have robots doing them. Like I'm sure there's going to be some parts of that look all fucked up. Um, I guess that's the thing is like, you know, like if you had, if you had the time to fix it, you could fix it, but you've got another game to make. You've got more skins to make. You've got more player models to make. And Hey, that was not a priority. So, but yeah, that, that would be a thing. If, if you went back in time and told me that, that we were still going to see backpacks hanging a couple of inches off of a guy or hair or hoods or whatever, still kind of clipping through parts of a guy's body or, you know, or whatever. Um, and that like long hair still looked like shit in a lot of cases. Um, I wouldn't believe I'd be like, what? No, come on. No, look at that stuff is that stuff stands out so much. Of course they would fix that. But, but here we are. And, and how are, how many games are massively negatively impacted by this stuff? I mean, just to put it in context, have you ever not purchased a game because you saw that like a backpack hovered off of a guy's back by an inch or two? Has that ever, how many, how many more copies of a game, how many more copies of a game does Activision sell by making sure that the submachine gun hangs properly? It's like zero. It's zero. So... The answer then is I, they're probably doing the right thing. 
They're focusing their resources on things that probably actually matter. Um, because they don't have an infinite number of people and an infinite amount of time to go and fix every little thing. You would think that one of the biggest games in the world, that they would just have that already. But here we are. You know? So yeah, technical showpieces and games, I think it's, it's a weird concept. It kind of always was. But um... But yeah, um, let's see. Harris writes in and says the Jeff Gersman hall of fame is a great collection of important video games from across the history of the medium. But let's imagine that this initiative suddenly grew to a physical museum, which you were tasked to fill beyond framed displays of each of your favorite games, which tangible pieces of video game history would you include in a museum, a space war arcade cabinet, the Nintendo PlayStation, those Nintendo Muppets from that one E3? Schick Hydrobot himself? Uh. <clears throat> well, Harold, I don't... Um, if I had to fill... Like, like, what do I view as important artifacts from video games? Um, it's the promotional 40 ounce that uh, THQ sent out with Saints Row. You have one of those on a pedestal. Something nice. Um, uh, the res, uh, synesthesia suit. I think that would be something that would be important to have and show. Um, I would set up an interactive exhibit where you copy a video game, where you copy a floppy. Like you've got a Commodore 64 there with two disk drives and the right parameters to copy it. And I would, I would, I would have it let you, let you make a copy of, of a game. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Skate uh, promotional skateboards throughout history. I have a Guitar Hero skateboard deck, and I have a autographed Tony Hawk skateboard, and I have uh, that Mortal Kombat One skateboard that I bought at that event that they had. Paid my own money for that one. Um, yeah, man. What else? I you know. Uh, Like a nice arcade. I don't know. Uh, I would have like kiosks throughout the museum that would just have a, a banner above it that just says like, fuck you, this game is good. <laughs> like here's Syndicate. Here's the 2012 release of Syndicate here and you can play it multiplayer on our private servers. Um, hmm. Important video game. I think, you know, like source code and stuff like that is always really interesting to me, but like, how do you display it? I bet, I bet the video game history foundation has a lot of ideas about, about that specifically. Like, how do you, how do you build an exhibit for some of this stuff? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, a backyard wrestling ring and the cast of backyard wrestler uh, wrestling is there to wrestle for all eternity. Madman Pondo and violent J just there to do it over and over again. Um, hmm. But yeah, I think there's, you know, there, there's important video games from throughout history that you could probably just have there. I think that that's the, that's probably the, the cop out answer is to like, what about video games? Like, yeah, you could do that. Um, I would almost think about it. Like, you know, like you would go and get like, in terms of like figuring out, like there's some historically notable video games that you would probably think would be no brainers. But I think you'd also go like, okay, like if we're going to make exhibits about people that are, you know, important throughout history, like, I don't know. John Romero will write, uh, you know, Warren Spector and, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, you know, video, you know, video game people. 
I would probably also have like them almost like a video store. It would be like employee picks and have them pick like, Hey, here are some games you should, you should see. Um, uh, and, uh, Mr. Caffeine would host all the tours. You would be forced to walk around with Mr. Caffeine and, uh, he would say something. I would set it up so like basically like one out of every five tours Mr. Caffeine says something untoward sort toward towards someone and then uh John Drake shows up and gets him fired. <laughs> and you get to watch that whole thing on you get to watch that all happen. Um Yeah, I don't know. I yeah, stuff like that I think I would, I would probably go for. Um but uh, I would try to recreate some parts of like the E3 show floor and try to like say like, here's what these spaces looked like that were not open to the public. And, uh, and say like, here's kind of what, here's kind of what an E3 sort of looked like in terms of like this number of kiosks and you had people waiting in line and here's a big screen showing the Metal Gear trailer over and over again. Um, <clears throat> like something devoted to that, I think would be kind of interesting. Um, and I would, uh, I would let people, I, I, you know, I think, I think having like cool stuff for kids to do really helps museums, uh, you know, just do better. <laughs> like people want to visit them. I would create an exhibit where you are making your own FMV video game. And it would be sort of like a you're in the movies type situation where the entire game is made except for one role. And then you go stand in front of a green screen and act out certain parts or read certain lines. And then a disc is burned and then you have a Sega CD game or some other format or whatever. And then you, you can go play it and you can go play it on, on real hardware. I think that would be fucking rad. Um, uh, and I don't know. That's about it. Uh, thanks, uh, Harvey, for, for writing with that one. Um, last one here. Will from Washington State. I recently received a permanent ban from Modern Warfare 3 for unclear reasons. This is obviously frustrating, but also a bit interesting to me, since I don't think I've ever received a ban before in all my decades of gaming. Have you ever received a ban? If so, was it justified? <clears throat> um, unclear reasons is really interesting. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You're free, right? I mean, go, go do something else, I guess. No, I, have I ever gotten banned from a video game completely? Um... Just uh, just that AEW mobile game, which I just uninstalled Blue Stacks from this PC yesterday, but the the AEW uh, idle game Rise to the Top or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, I was running Cheat Engine on that to give myself a, a ton of uh, points or whatever, uh, and and eventually my account got like when you launch it, it just it just can't it just quits out. But I was never really sure if that was just a blue stacks bug because it's such a blue stacks is such a piece of shit. Um or um or if uh, or if I was uh, legitimately banned. I suppose I could try reinstalling it on the built-in Windows Android stuff while that's still there. But taking that out. Remember when they made that big deal about like Windows is going to run Android apps. We got out of this whole layer that, you know, that you're going to be able to virtualize an Android device and, and run Android stuff here in the Amazon app store. And like they have since shut down the Amazon app store inside of windows 11. And then in March of 2025, they're just shutting the fucking whole thing off, I guess. But there are other ways to, you know, you don't have to, it's not just blue stacks or nothing at that point. There's a lot of other ways to, to do it. Um, it's unfortunate because I, I thought that stuff worked for like, I used to I used to primarily look at TikTok through the Windows subsystem for Android. That was that was usually that was I, what I was using it most for. Um but I haven't used that that way for a while, so I don't know. Uh 
yeah, I don't know. I, I that's the only thing I got banned from. I think. I think. I think that's a ban. Um, for unclear reasons is really funny. I mean, were you fucking shitty in voice chat for a really long time, like repeatedly, or were you cheating? What even constitutes cheating? So, so I've been thinking about this. Um, and I don't know what the answer to this question is because I haven't really researched it, but people buy devices that, you know, bolt onto their controllers. Um, or, you know, sometimes it's devices that let you use mouse and keyboard while the game thinks you're on controller. Um, but like the, the, the Cronus Zen or the Cronus Max, I think is what it's called now. Um, and ostensibly these devices are for like, oh, you could use a PS4 controller on a PS5 if you did this, or you could use this, or, you know, that's a bad example. Cause I mean, you can do that. But it, like, it was like, you could, you could use different controllers on a console than was intended for with that, with those, some of those things. And then also they're like, also, we've got some, some game specific packs that you can install onto the controller that will do some stuff. And it seems like do some stuff is like eliminate all recoil from the guns which very much seems like cheating. Um, but like basically they're optimizing and, and kind of modifying some of the stuff with the controller to, to make you have better aim in some shooters. And there's like, they, they sell modules for apex and some of this other stuff. And I was looking at their site the other day and, um, At no point in, in, in this thing do they say you might get banned for using these. Because, of course, why would they say that? You wouldn't buy it if, if that, that was a, a, an upfront risk. But I don't know if that's, like, I don't know if that stuff is allowed. I know that that's kind of, like, been the, the, the easy kind of low-level cheat that whenever people are, like, talking shit about a, a streamer, um, you know, being a little like good at a game or something is like, Oh yeah. Show me your controller. Show me your setup. I bet you're plugged into one of those things. And I bet you're running this. And you know, I watched your kill cam and that your, your, your recoil is too perfect. Your aim is too snappy. Your, this is too this, that it's not quite an aim bot. Um, but it is something bolted onto their controller that is intercepting the signal and, you know, preventing recoil or, or doing whatever else it's a, it's interesting. I, it's like something I, I would be interested to fuck around with, but also I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily want to get banned from anything and I don't really want to cheat in games. I'm just curious to see if that stuff actually works and, and what the, you know, I, I know some of this stuff is why, uh, Xbox did that round of firmware updates not that long ago where they, you know, they banned a lot of, uh, unauthorized or unlicensed, I should say controllers. Um, <clears throat> And so when you plug stuff in, it pops up a message saying like, this is not an authorized controller that they were, they were trying to impact that stuff at a system level. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what that stuff is all about. Um, it seems shady as fuck. And because they don't want to go out of their way to even tell you anything really about what it is they do. Like they're trying to sell it as like a subscription service, which says to me, like, Hey, there are going to be countermeasures that render this ineffective. And so we're always going to have to have updates and you'll have to plug this into your PC and download new firmware so you can play call of duty properly or whatever. And that seems fucked. Um, or something you don't want to mess around with. I don't know. Or maybe you don't, maybe you don't care. Maybe you just, you know, like, fuck it. You get banned and you get banned. Um, but no, I, I can't think of any situations where I've been like straight up banned from a game other than that one, which was totally justified. I was cheating in a game that did have, it does have a multiplayer component in it, like leaderboards or whatever. And they give out prizes based on the leaderboards. So I was theoretically able to get even more premium currency or whatever the fuck it was. Um, but you know, uh, Let's see here. Um, Caleb from Connecticut writes and says, currently having a deb debate and I need your expert opinion. Is untoasted bread raw? My friends are profusely exclaiming that untoasted bread is referred to as raw bread, but no, it's not. It's baked bread. It's not raw. Raw bread would be dough, right? Right? 
Yeah, no, your friends are fucking idiots. Your friends are straight up dipshits. That's not raw at all. Like that is that is bread that has been baked and cooled. If you want to toast it afterward, that's that's twice cooked bread. Is what that is. When you when you toast, when you make toast. <clears throat> But it's, it's certainly not raw. Uh, your, your friends are gross. Uh, Adam in the UK asks um, if Valve will try to make a Steam PC again. Mm. I've been a PC gamer for almost 30 years now, and I occasionally speak to my console gaming friends about PC gaming. And whilst they're avid gamers, they still have little to no interest in PC gaming for usually one of the following reasons. One, price. Uh, while PC gaming covers a variety of price ranges, you cannot argue that the price to performance on consoles cannot be matched. Try and build a PC for $250 that matches the performance of a Series S or even $450 for a PS5 without looking at the pre-owned market. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> space. Consoles can go under the TV. So can PCs, but it's much more cumbersome. Plug and play. They like to turn on and play games and whilst it's much better today than it was in the 90s and 2000s, troubleshooting a PC problem if you're just here for gaming can be a pain. So at least to my question, do you think Valve will try the Steam PC again? It seems like a lot of non-PC players have warmed to the PC or at least Steam with the re re release of the Steam Deck. And the Steam Deck should, or a Steam PC should in theory alleviate all three issues in my circle of friends and I assume a lot of console players have about PC gaming. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I think that a, a pre-built steam PC would not necessarily hit console level pricing. It would probably still end up being more expensive. The, the price, the price conversation that people usually have about PC versus console is typically that you end up spending more upfront on the PC, but you make it up on the back end because the games are often cheaper or go on sale more frequently or, or whatever. Um, there are a lot more sales on console stores than there used to be. So that's maybe not quite as, um, cut and dry as it used to be. Um, space, like you can make small PCs for sure. Uh, Nvidia just in, kind of endorsed a new form factor. Um, I guess not. they, they have a specification for SFF PC, I guess just small form factor uh, for PCs uh, for their graphics cards. And so they're going to be able to say like, hey, this graphics card is SFF compliant. And you'll know that it is only a certain length or width or whatever. So that if you have a case that is also compliant to those specs, the graphics card should fit in the case. Um, but it's um, it's not good. Their, their largest cards, their, their most powerful cards is, are not going to, are not going to be compliant to that for sure. Um, you know, you could take a steam deck and you could plug it into a TV right now and you could just hook up a controller to it. And I'm pretty sure you can wake up the steam deck from a controller and you could, you could do that. You know, the, the power is, you know, if, if you did a full PC, you would be able to ostensibly stuff more power in there. Um, and I'm not sure the state of Steam OS in terms of like in installing Linux onto one of those PCs or installing Valve's particular um, brand of, you know, their their flavor of it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how well supported that is. You'd probably run into some weird driver issues here and there, but I, I know people are, are doing that. Um, and so you could kind of do it it's just not being sold as a pre-built product, you know? Uh, I think this is something that could happen. This is something that could come around again. I don't know that Valve necessarily does it, but you could see, especially as Steam OS continues to mature, um, <coughs> and once they do, yeah, so it's not, that's, Steam OS for Steam Deck is not available to the public. I think there are ways to, crime it off of it or maybe you have to use an older version i forget what the situation is but um but you could see a world where that is eventually made available in a way that um 
that you could do that. And, and, and people are using Proton to play Windows games on regular Linux PCs and, and whatever else. So you could see someone trying to configure a setup that way that basically combines the, the power or the, the, the software magic of the Steam Deck and a more powerful computer that is meant for a television. Um, and, and get, you know, at least somewhat close to what the Steam Deck experience would be there. Um, but it's funky, you know, and if you're a console player that doesn't want, ever want to touch anything, that's, that's not going to be for you. Right. But also I, I don't think that even my Steam Deck, like, and, and granted I'm on the, the preview fork and stuff, but like right now, when I, when I try to go to desktop mode, half the time it just shuts down or the screen goes black. It doesn't actually shut down because the fan still runs. Um, but I, I'm on the preview fork, so whatever. Um, but the Steam Deck can be finicky in spots too. It's not always um, perfect. But console games crash all the time too. The difference is that when a console game crashes, you kind of have zero uh, recourse. It's like, oh, I guess I got to wait for a patch on this. Whereas sometimes <clears throat> issues on a PC game, you might be able to um, fix them yourself if you're so inclined, but I don't know. That's not for everybody for sure. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on the, the, yeah, whatever the, the, the most frequently updated branch of the Steam Deck OS. I forget, there was some, there was some feature at the time that I wanted and I didn't want to wait for, and so I switched over to that. I can't remember what it is now, what, or what, what the feature was, but, um, but yeah, I should probably change it back to stable and, and, and whatever else. Cause I, I don't really need, I don't really need that. The, uh, the cloud syncing functionality in RetroArch has made it, made its way out into Linux builds. And so now iOS devices and Linux devices can take advantage of cloud synced saves, um, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> so I have my steam deck syncing with my phone. Um, except for some reason last night, the Steam Deck stopped syncing. And I don't know why. The server is still right here. It's still, it's right on the other side of this wall. Um, but for whatever reason, it, it wouldn't connect to it. So I, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a very new feature. It's super fucking finicky. Um, and uh, so I'm not surprised that I'm having a little trouble with it, but, but it's theoretically out there if you wanna set up a web dev server and do some weird shit. Um, And yeah, that's going to do it for the show. Thanks everybody for listening. <clears throat> Man, I have got to figure out this allergy thing before all these streams come up because my throat is fucking shot. <laughs> um, I got some nasal spray here. I could probably hit some of that up. I don't know. Maybe I'll try some of this. See what it does for me. Um, anyway, I'll be back tomorrow. We'll do something with video games for a little bit. Um, assuming I can talk, uh, and then we'll be back on Friday to play some eight bit Nintendo games and to see what Jeff Keighley has for the world of video games, uh, as well. And then of course I'll be back on Sunday to talk about the Microsoft stuff and on Monday for Ubisoft. And then the rest of that time on the weekend, I will be off seeing some unreleased video games. So that'll be fun. Uh, and I'll do some stuff with that. I have some inter a couple of interviews and one interview. Anyway, I have, I have some, some stuff appointments and, and such lined up. So I'll, that will probably, uh, filter its way into the podcast on the following week. So, um, so yeah, take care of yourselves and I will see you on this podcast next week. Bye.